One evening near the base of Tianmen Mountain in Xinjiang, a group of individuals were observed wandering with torches in hand for illumination. It appeared as though they were in search of something. I have been scouring Tianmen Mountain for two weeks now, and at last I have stumbled upon it, he murmured upon perusing the contents of the document. Although the script on the paper was peculiar, there was no doubt that it was the original text. This document was a confidential message. The hidden message contained within was a fabled technique passed down by a swordmaster six centuries ago. Inwardly, he thought, I wish to keep this to myself, but it is of no use to me with my damaged Dantian. Moreover, martial arts experts will attempt to seize it from me if they discover I possess it. I must conceal it. He took the initiative to ingest the scroll containing the confidential message. However, upon swallowing it, he began to choke. I should have brought water to aid in swallowing it smoothly, he lamented. Ah, you are here, he exclaimed in shock as two individuals suddenly addressed him. They were members of the Murim Alliance and the leader of the Golden Dragon Clan, Mo Yong Su. Greetings, spies from the Blood Cult. Have you located the secret notes of the Sword Sage? Anxious, he replied, Yes, sir. I have found it and secured it in a safe location. I will entrust it to you if you uphold your end of the bargain. The elderly man, stroking his beard, responded, I am aware of your request. You seek the removal of the blood parasite in your chest, correct? Baek Yang, the old man, was one of the esteemed elders of the Murim Alliance. Surprisingly, Mo Yong Su unsheathed his sword, affirming the existence of an agreement. However, he stated that there was no need for us to seize it. Even if we were to remove the blood parasite from your chest, you would have no place to return to. Am I correct in assuming that you are Wun Hui from the Radiant Earth Clan? After your Dantian was destroyed due to a Qi deviation, you were banished from your clan. Furthermore, ten years ago, you were abducted by the Blood Cult, who implanted a blood parasite in your chest. Since then, you have been manipulated as a puppet under their control. Even if I grant you freedom here, where else would you go? Am I mistaken? Wun Hui was taken aback by Mo Yong Su's extensive knowledge about him. Curious, Wun Hui inquired about his true intentions. While waving his sword, Mo Yong Su demanded the surrender of the Sword Sage's secret notes. If Wun Hui complied, Mo Yong Su would consider removing the blood parasite from his chest. Calmly, Wun Hui responded that the secret notes were concealed in a location known only to him. Mo Yongsu himself understood the predicament Wun Hui was in. Wun Hui did not seek any special treatment. He simply desired liberation from the clutches of the blood cult and the chance to live a normal life. Wun Hui also proposed a deal to Baek Yang. Firstly, remove the blood parasite from my chest. If you do so, I will willingly hand over the secret notes. Both Wun Hui and Baek Yang shared a laugh. You are quite astute. Unexpectedly, while laughing, Mo Yongsu thrust his sword into Wun Hui's left chest, remarking, It's evident. How does a spy conceal things? I suspect you have hidden it on your person. It appears that their intention was to eliminate me from the very beginning. Witnessing Wun Hui's suffering from his injuries, Mo Yongsu expressed, Do not hold any grudge against us. Once you become a spy, your fate is sealed to meet such an end. Despite the agony he was enduring, Wun Hui was taken aback. Why must I endure such a life? Why do I have to keep tearing apart? Wun Hui searched for the hidden note, only to be astonished when his sword cut through the sword sage's secret notes. It was revealed that the secret note was concealed within his own body. What was even more astonishing was that, after Mo Yong Su approached him, a blue light flashed. What is this? What is happening? Why are flames emerging from my body? Wun Hui's consciousness began to fade, his vision growing dim. There is no hope. I do not feel any heat. Is this fire merely an illusion? However, none of that mattered, as he was facing death. If a second life truly exists, I hope the next one will not be as sorrowful. Suddenly, two individuals chuckled as they splashed water on Wun Hui. Look at you, how pitiful. Wun Hui realized, feeling his damp body, that he was not injured and had no burns. Hey, feeble Wun Hui, you have finally awakened. 
We are as swift as Hunan Daos in winning that game once more. Surprised, he muttered to himself, pondering the situation. These champions were Song Zhuabek and Song Wu Hyun, the black and white duo from Blood Cult. Why do they appear so youthful? Not to mention I just perished in flames. Yet I recall that we were quite close when we were young. Suddenly Woon Hui yelled in shock as he caught sight of his reflection in the mirror. This is my countenance from my youth. Without delay, Zhuabek swiftly delivered a kick to Woon Hui. Are you still under the influence of alcohol? It is time for you to awaken and settle your debts. Although it pained him, he was taken aback by the intensity of the sensation. It feels so genuine that it seems like a mere illusion. Woon Hui awakens. He promptly becomes intrigued and inquires about the current date from Zhuabek. Startled, Zhuabek seizes his hand. What are you speaking of? Woon Hui responds, I simply asked for today's date. It is not a complex question. Wu Yun also mentions that it is currently August 9th, the 11th year of the sexagenary cycle. This calendar system utilized 60 years as a single cycle. Reflecting on the 11th year, if today is August 9th, this 11th year is a decade prior to my demise. Wu Hyun asks, What year do you believe it is now? Have you lost your wits due to excessive drinking? Embracing Jobek, one bursts into laughter. I am delighted to see you. Tuabek, I am truly grateful to God. Subsequently, Woon Hui comprehends. Wait exactly 10 years. If this was precisely a decade ago, then today is not the present day. The night grows late. Suddenly, a group of individuals clad in black attire arrives. The innkeeper, roused from his slumber, is taken aback. He assumes that these individuals are patrons. With so many guests arriving at this late hour, he summons someone within the inn. Quickly, come out and welcome them. Abruptly, one of the men in black swiftly decapitates the guard. In the room, Woon Hui frantically searches for something that should be present. Zhuabek believes that Woon Hui is in search of money. Instead of denying it, it is a clear warning that if you wish to survive, you must leave this place immediately. Zhuabek was taken aback by Woon Hui's peculiar words. You have been behaving strangely ever since. Should I teach you a lesson? Finally, when he found the item he had been searching for, they finally met. It is my mother's sole inheritance. I deeply regret the loss I experienced in my previous life. Even if it is crucial to escape, I must take this sword with me. Suddenly, a loud scream pierced through the air. Someone out there shouted for help. It appeared as though the sound was originating from outside. Woon Hui believes that the volume of the scream is too loud if it is coming from outside. Now is not the time to ponder over that. This scream signifies the beginning of a massacre. Zhuabek and Wu Hyun cautiously peered through the window and witnessed a group of individuals dressed in black charging towards them. Who are they? What should we do? Woon Hui hurriedly approached the window. Step aside and let me see. It turns out that they truly are a blood cult. August 9th of the 11th year was the day I was abducted, Zhuabek murmured, questioning if the intruders were bandits aiming to plunder the area. Woon Hui promptly refuted the idea, stating that they were actually members of the blood cult. Time was running out, and they would soon arrive. If they wished to survive, they needed to flee immediately. Zhuabek was taken aback, finding it hard to believe that they were truly followers of the blood cult. Perhaps they had vanished after their defeat by the Murim Alliance. Upon hearing this, Wu Hyun suggested that they should also escape. Woon Hui wasted no time and ran off, leaving Zhuabek and Wahin behind. Dwelling on their fate was pointless. They would likely become martial arts experts after being taken by the blood cult. As long as he survived, everything would be fine. Suddenly, Woon Hui recalled someone else who was with them. It turned out that there was another person in their group. Ah Song was frantically searching for them. Woon Hui realized that Ah Song should also join them. He was the only one from the Shining Earth Clan who stood by his side. He couldn't disregard someone he considered his own little brother. Ah Song, who was in a deep slumber, was startled when Woon Hui let out an unexpected scream. Ah Song quickly woke up, exclaiming, I assure you, sir, I wasn't sleeping. Ah Song felt a wave of relief wash over him when he realized it was the young master. 
Oh, it's you, sir. You startled me, he said. Woon Hui swiftly grabbed Ah Song, urging him to get up as they needed to leave immediately. We are currently under attack by the blood cult. They will soon infiltrate this inn, Woon Hui informed him. Ah Song found it hard to believe, considering that the Muram Alliance had supposedly defeated the blood cult. Nevertheless, Woon Hui continued to lead Ah Song in a hurried escape. Trust me, we cannot leave through the main entrance. The entire city is surrounded and we will be caught if we attempt to flee, Wun Hui explained. Upon hearing this, Ah Song suggested hiding in a cupboard as a possible solution. However, Wun Hui immediately dismissed the idea, calling it foolish. You will certainly discover the truth there. Their intention is not to steal our treasures, but rather to apprehend individuals like us. They will meticulously search all potential hiding spots, such as cupboards or large jars, Ah Song inquires of the master whether they will be captured and executed. Please refrain from speaking of such dreadful possibilities. Regardless, we must find a secure hiding place, one that is unexpected. Even if they consider searching there, they will not suspect anyone to be concealed. They decided to continue until they stumbled upon a hut. Is this the location you mentioned, sir? Indeed, I am confident that they will not suspect anyone to be hiding here. Ah Song objected to hiding in the toilet, expressing discomfort. Sir, if this spot is comfortable, it would be wise for you to conceal yourself here. Woon Hui insisted, urging Ah Song to comply. You must hide here, as there is only space for one person. I will search for an alternative hiding place. It is unlikely that even the blood cultists would search this area. I will locate another hiding spot before the cult arrives. Upon noticing the tied horse, it became apparent that fate had other plans for me. I released the horse to mislead the cult members rather than riding it. I must remain vigilant and hold on to my sword, as skilled martial artists could detect me through their chi. There was a sudden noise that caught Woon Hui's attention. He frowned at the insolent child before him. Don't touch me with your dirty hands, he warned, urging the child to remove them. Who do you think you are? I told you to clean your hands, he scolded, frustrated by the child's disregard. Woon Hui was taken aback when the sword spoke. Why does this sword speak? He wondered aloud, surprised by the unexpected occurrence. He couldn't help but question if the sword was possessed by a ghost. Is your head ghost a ghost? He asked, bewildered. The sword identified itself as the Sodam sword, passed down from his mother. Woon Hui couldn't believe his ears. Wait. Are you answering me? He asked, realizing that he could hear the words of the sword. Astonished, he witnessed the sword transforming into a fairy-like figure. So the sword's true form is that of a fairy, he mused, still in awe. Curiosity struck him, and he wondered if he could also see the fairy's form. If you can hear me, can you also see my form? He inquired, eager to understand the extent of his newfound ability. Woon Hui couldn't help but question his own sanity. Am I hallucinating? He pondered, considering the possibility of it being an illusion. Frustrated, he admitted, I cannot see you. I can't hear you. However, the sword fairy reassured him, claiming that Woon Hui could indeed see and hear it. We sword fairies can read the minds of humans who have wielded the swords, the fairy explained, dispelling any doubts. Woon Hui was amazed to realize that it wasn't an illusion after all. I could actually see and hear it, he acknowledged, his astonishment growing. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps interrupted their conversation. The fairy urged Woon Hui to be quiet as the approaching figures drew near. Despite the distraction, the fairy continued to babble, causing Woon Hui to wonder if it was because of the approaching person. The fairy assured him, don't worry, you're the only one who can hear me. As the person approached, Woon Hui observed their movements his hand ready to grip his sword in preparation for any threat. Upon witnessing Woon Hui's response, the fairy gently inquired about your intentions to harm him. Whether or not you possess supernatural abilities, it won't make a difference if he catches you. I questioned whether you had the courage to listen to the sound of your own heartbeat, or if fear had taken hold of you. Recalling the moment when Mo Yong Su ruthlessly seized the sword sage's confidential writings, resulting in his brutal demise. The followers of the blood cult were drawing near. Woon Hui swiftly struck and eliminated him. 
As the cult member breathed his last breath, Wun Hui vowed with a fierce determination, I am not afraid. In fact, I am thrilled. Just wait and see. I will endure. Regardless of what challenges life throws my way this time. The sword fairy was astonished to see Wun Hui successfully take down one of the special members. It seems like you have some skills after all. I used to think you were just a drunken fool at work. Perhaps I misjudged you. Where did you learn to fight like that? Wun Hui, annoyed by the sword fairy's constant chatter, told her to be quiet and ignore the situation for now. The blood cult warriors are known to operate in groups, usually consisting of three members on a mission. It's likely that the slain members' comrades will arrive soon. Despite hiding the body, it's only a matter of time before they discover it. Wun Hui realized that if he got caught, he would be killed immediately. He needed to finish the task at hand and leave quickly. Suddenly, the sword fairy sensed someone behind Wun Hui and warned him. Wun Hui turned around to find one of the special members observing him. Are you bothered by my presence? Please continue with what you were doing. I've only been observing you. Why did you suddenly fall silent? How long have you known I was here? Wun Hui noticed the warrior's belt and realized he was a middle-class warrior. He braced himself knowing that he was not well-equipped to face a warrior of that caliber in his current state. Upon witnessing Wun Hui's reaction, the fairy's excitement grew instantly. Are you prepared to engage in combat? I am here to assist you. Allow me to demonstrate the true power of a middle-class warrior's sword, the fairy eagerly expressed. Slowly approaching Wun Hui, he remarked, It appears that you have not studied self-defense. Nevertheless, even if it was a surprise attack, you displayed enough strength to defeat a low-class warrior like him. The fairy also assessed Wun Hui's capabilities, stating, Based on my observation, it seems that your abilities align with those of a middle-class warrior. Offering a proposition, he continued, I will present you with an opportunity. If you surrender now, I will spare your life. Hearing this offer from a member of the blood cult, Wun Hui attempted to provoke him. If your intention was truly to kill me from the beginning, you wouldn't be discussing intermediate quality or anything of the sort. So in reality, you desire to engage in a fight with me. However, I am too formidable. And you fear suffering the same fate as that individual, Wun Hui confidently asserted. The fairy was taken aback by Wun Hui's words. Are you out of your mind? Why are you provoking him? Ignoring the sword fairy's concerns, Wun Hui continued with his plan. I will feign arrogance to lower his guard even further. Let's see if he falls for it, he thought. Upon hearing Wun Hui's boastful chatter, the warrior burst into laughter. You certainly have a talent for acting. It would be a pity to have to eliminate a young individual like yourself. It seems you are doing your utmost to avoid a confrontation, the warrior remarked. Suddenly, the warrior swiftly launched an attack on Wun Hui. Let's find out if you truly possess the strength you claim, he challenged. Wun Hui deftly evaded the assault. Despite being a warrior with a destroyed Dantian, I could still perceive such attacks with clarity. Wun Hui attempted a counterattack, but his movements were sluggish, allowing the warrior to easily seize his arm. I must admit, I am impressed by your keen eyesight, although your speed leaves much to be desired. Your unexpected retaliation caught me off guard. I will overlook the fact that you defeated a lower-ranked warrior. Remember, do not engage when your opponent is unprepared. Wun Hui swiftly freed the knife from his grasp and aimed a direct strike at the warrior's face. Despite being taken by surprise, the warrior managed to evade the attack. It seemed impossible for him to dodge an assault from his blind spot. Enraged, the warrior forcefully kicked Wun Hui, sending him flying a great distance. Enduring the pain, I questioned my own confidence. Could he truly dodge such close-range attacks? Wun Hui made an effort to rise to his feet while he wiped away the blood from his mouth. He realized that he had no other option but to confront the situation head on. The sword fairy persisted in persuading Wun Hui to accept her assistance in order to defeat the middle-class warrior. I promise to aid you. Without my help, your chances of winning against him are slim, she asserted. Reflecting on the circumstances, Wun Hui pondered on how to overcome this formidable opponent. The previous attack failed to eliminate him, but since his left eye was injured, 
targeting his vulnerable left side seemed like the best strategy. Despite the pain in his eyes, the warrior endured. Even though I tried to be kind to you, you continue to act like a despicable person. Do you truly desire death? Initially, Wun Hui only intended to teach him a lesson and deliver him to the Blood Cult clan. However, due to his insolence, Wun Hui decided to put an end to him right then and there. The warrior charged towards Wun Hui, utilizing the fundamental sword technique of the Blood Cult known as the Killing Blood Blade to launch an assault. He relentlessly unleashed a series of sword strikes at Wun Hui, carefully observing the warrior's attack pattern. Despite enduring the onslaught, Wun Hui realized that the warrior deliberately avoided targeting his vital areas, opting to prolong his suffering. Filled with determination, the warrior executed a final attack, leaving no room for remorse. Your fate is sealed to perish in this place, he declared. Despite being familiar with the intermediate warrior's tactics, Wun Hui found himself only able to defend without the opportunity to retaliate. Resorting to deceptive maneuvers once again, Wun Hui pondered his next move. Acting impulsively, he attempted to strike back, hoping to land a blow. In a moment of desperation, the sword fairy whispered to Wun Hui, revealing that the warrior would launch a frontal thrust. Reacting swiftly, Wun Hui blocked the incoming attack aimed at his midsection. Although he managed to withstand the blow, the force behind the middle-class warrior's strike sent Wun Hui tumbling backwards. Witnessing his failed attempt, the warrior was taken aback, realizing that his meticulously planned feint had not succeeded. Upon attempting to rise, he pondered over what transpired. How was I able to endure his assault so effectively? You witnessed how you managed to withstand that strike. Were it not for me, you would likely be deceased. Inquiring if the voice just heard belonged to him, so you can anticipate the attacks. The sword fairy could discern the strike of a middle-class warrior wielding a sword like that. It is quite simple for us to interpret. While turning Wun Hui's head, what is your next course of action? Should I maintain silence as instructed by you? Wun Hui sheepishly admitted, I apologize for disregarding you twice. I implore you, can you assist me? The sword fairy haughtily responded, I suppose I will aid you. I cannot allow a being like you, who has finally heeded my words after forty-seven years, to perish in this manner. The sword fairy also inquired about your intentions. After being able to predict the attack patterns, Wun Hui attempted to strategize. How can I defeat him? I have contemplated it. However, it remains quite challenging given my current circumstances. He has already fallen victim to my counterattack once. Therefore, he will not dare to approach the range of my sword again. Undoubtedly, he will always maintain a safe distance from my grasp. With a piercing gaze, Wun Hui devised a plan. If we lure him and provoke impatience, then we may have an opportunity to overcome him. The middle-class warrior was still taken aback. He believed he had blocked my strike. How did he manage it? Perhaps he is familiar with my sword technique. I am certain it must be a mere coincidence. It is inconceivable that a feeble individual like him could intentionally withstand my attack. The warrior launched another assault. Behold, this time I shall end your life. The sword fairy provided instructions to Wun Hui, instructing him to first defend against all incoming attacks to create a window of opportunity. Wun Hui requested the fairy to inform him about the direction of the attack. The fairy revealed that it would be a deceptive attack aimed at the left shoulder, advising Wun Hui to focus on his right side. Witnessing Wun Hui's swift reaction and ability to withstand the attack, the warrior became even more astonished. He wondered how this seemingly weak individual could anticipate his moves. As the warrior's left eye became obstructed by blood, he became careless, allowing Wun Hui to launch a sudden counterattack. The fairy had predicted that the warrior would become impatient if his blind spot was targeted, resulting in a horizontal attack. Wun Hui patiently waited for the warrior to strike. True to the fairy's prediction, the warrior executed a horizontal attack when he believed Wun Hui would attack his vulnerable side. However, it turned out to be a ruse. Although one might expect Wun Hui to be caught off guard by this maneuver, he remained composed. The warrior forcefully kicked Wun Hui sending him flying through the air. With a mocking laugh, the warrior taunted Wun Hui, questioning if his hand was broken. 
Despite acknowledging Wun Hui's ability to exploit his blind spots, the warrior belittled him as a mere lowly warrior. The warrior proceeded to launch another attack, vowing to kill Wun Hui. Wun Hui's face lit up with a smile, knowing that the timing was perfect. With a swift movement, she launched herself towards the warrior, aiming directly for his neck. She couldn't believe how easily she defeated someone of his caliber. Triumphantly, she declared her victory, having successfully severed his neck. The sword fairy commended her acting skills, and expressed surprise at the seemingly broken arm. Wun Hui explained that any suspicion of her hand not being truly injured would have jeopardized her plan. The fairy praised her for her excellence and admired her final attack. Wun Hui acknowledged the fairy's assistance and expressed her gratitude. The fairy blushed, denying any feelings of shame and claiming to be merely surprised. She suggested that Wun Hui show her gratitude by properly cleaning her sword. Suddenly, Wun Hui felt a sharp pain as a punch landed on her face, causing her to lose consciousness. It turned out that a member of the special blood cult had arrived and attacked them. The situation seemed unreasonable, as both Wun Hui and the warrior had been defeated by this seemingly weak individual. Wun Hui's body underwent examination by specialized blood cult troops, revealing identification tags. Surprisingly, this boy's true name is Su Wun Hui originating from Yiyang District in Luoyang City. The records indicate that he hails from a time when the earth shone. One of the warriors recognized his name, recalling him as a loser from Henan Province and labeling him as the outcast of Luoyang City. Regrettably, his own family treated him as a stranger, especially after his Dantian suffered a key deviation. However, I have a suggestion, sir. Considering his lineage as a child of an Orthodox clan, what if we were to take him in and train him as a spy? The warrior captain dismissed the idea, deeming it unnecessary. He believed there was no point in raising this individual who lacked a Dantian of his own. In fact, he was certain that even basic training would lead to his demise. It appeared that Wun Hui was incapable of enduring such hardships. Furthermore, observe his current state. Despite his origins from a relatively renowned clan, he was so terrified that he involuntarily urinated. This indicates that he cannot be considered a valuable asset. It is best to eliminate him completely. Upon hearing the warrior captain's words, Wun Hui wept and pleaded, Please spare my life, sir. I promise to do whatever you ask, even if it means becoming a spy. Wun Hui's hands were bound behind his back, and he couldn't help but recall the sword fairy. Despite his efforts to avoid this situation, he found himself in a predicament once again. The warrior captain commended Wun Hui for his skills, acknowledging his prowess even without a Dantian. This recognition brought a sense of relief to Wun Hui, who vowed to stay positive and ensure his safety for the time being. The warrior captain abruptly declared that the boy must be killed. However, one of his subordinates interjected, suggesting that the boy could be a valuable asset if properly trained. The captain insisted that the boy could serve as a spy, but acknowledged that there were others with more potential for espionage due to their Dantians. Frustrated, the captain ordered for the boy to be swiftly eliminated. Wun Hui pondered on how to persuade the captain, realizing that the only difference was the captain's perception of him. With no other option, Wun Hui resorted to pleading once again. Amidst laughter, the captain mocked Wun Hui for attempting to beg after testing his limits. The captain urged Wun Hui to face the consequences of his actions for causing harm to his comrades. In a state of desperation, Wun Hui contemplated that the situation was even more dire than his past experiences. He resolved to buy some time, even if only momentarily, refusing to meet his end after returning to the past. As a warrior member prepared to strike with his sword, the captain continued to taunt Wun Hui for his desperate attempts to escape. Wun Hui was taken aback when he noticed a decorated sword positioned behind the warrior captain. I have encountered that sword previously. The white embellishment on the sword's hilt caught my eye. Wun Hui promptly bowed down to the ground, offering praise to the diamond and wishing the blood cult longevity. I am unworthy to be in the presence of a blood star. Upon hearing Wun Hui's words, the warriors were taken aback and exchanged glances. Is the blue star among us? 
Observing the reactions of his subordinates, the warrior captain reprimanded them for being too loud. How could someone like the Bloodstar be here? Before he could finish his sentence, the warrior captain was stunned and immediately prostrated himself upon seeing one of the Blood Stars standing behind him. The eleven executives who lead the Blood Cult, the fourth Venerable Ones, and the seventh Blood Stars. I have never encountered any of them before. However, I have heard rumors that Blood Stars sometimes disguise themselves as low-ranking warriors to observe them. He slowly approached Wun Hui and instructed him to raise his head. You are quite perceptive. I have never been discovered during an inspection before. I am Dojang Ho, one of the members of the fourth Blood Star in the Blood Cult. How did you manage to find me when you are not a member of the Blood Cult? Wun Hui calmly replied, pointing to his sword, sir. The intricate design on the hilt gave you away. I have heard that the decorations are meant to match your horse's saddle. Upon hearing Wun Hui's spontaneous response, Dojang Ho smiled faintly. You have keen eyes. Du Jiang Ho proceeded to question Wun Hui further. Now answer this. How would someone who is not part of the blood cult know about this? Wun Hui paused briefly, contemplating how to respond in a manner that would not raise any suspicions from Dojan. It would be odd for him to suspect me without reason. In my past life, I operated as a spy for the blood cult within the Orthodox faction, encountering similar situations countless times over the span of seven years. With composure and caution, Wun Hui provided an answer, drawing upon the fact that I have familial ties to the blood cult. I harbored a deep sense of confidence in my ability to deceive when necessary. The warriors were taken aback upon learning of Wun Hui's connection to the blood cult. Did he just reveal that there were descendants of the blood cult within the Radiant Earth Clan? How could this be possible? Wun Hui went on to explain that my grandfather from my mother's side had fought in the Orthodox War as a low-ranking soldier in the Wolfblood troops. Following a severe injury sustained in battle, he embarked on a journey to seek a new home with his sole family member, my mother. This led my grandfather to settle in Luoyang City. Wun Hui elaborated on the challenges my grandfather faced in finding a place to call home after fleeing from the war, as the wounds he carried within could not be easily healed. My mother took on the responsibility of covering my grandfather's medical expenses while working as a servant for the Radiant Earth Clan. It was during this time that my mother crossed paths with my father, sparking a romance that ultimately resulted in my birth into the Radiant Earth family. The man inquired, So your grandfather was a member of the Blood Wolf Squad? Quite intriguing. Please continue your story. During my childhood, my grandfather trained me. Whenever I complained or struggled with a difficult workout, my grandfather would immediately mention Captain No Joman and his son No, who were part of the Wolfblood Army. He would tell me that Captain No Joman's son had completed all the training of the Wolfblood Army at my age. The warriors were astonished when Wun Hui mentioned the Wolfblood Captain. They wondered how this boy knew the name of the current captain. Moreover, my grandfather always warned that the blood cult would come looking for us one day. Even five years ago, in his final moments, he nostalgically spoke about the blood wolf. Upon hearing this, Du Jiang Ho thought, I understand now. This explains how you were able to kill two of our followers, despite having a destroyed Dantian. Surprisingly, the warrior captain exclaimed, Oh, Lord Bloodstar, please disregard what that boy said. I have no idea where he learned about the wolf blood army. Before he could finish his sentence, Do Jiang Ho abruptly turned around with a piercing gaze. He questioned Captain O, oh, who gave you permission to interrupt me? Being the captain of the Diamond Tiger Warriors doesn't grant you the audacity to defy the words of a star. Instantly, the warrior captain submitted, saying, Forgive my impertinence, sir. I will not repeat it again. Witnessing this incident, Wun Hui remained silent. It was astonishing to see a captain succumb to fear with just a few words and a stern look. This was one of the powers of the Blood Star. Do Jiang Ho then approached Wun Hui once more. However, there was an oddity in the situation. While it is permissible to kill our members in self-defense, why did you choose not to reveal your identity to Captain O oh and instead pleaded not to be harmed? Wun Hui maintained his silence, looking down as he attempted to provide an explanation. I was afraid of facing consequences for eliminating two blood cult members. Please forgive me, sir, 
he said, bowing his head in resignation. Wun Hui considered himself quite perceptive, realizing that even when he mixed truth with lies, Dou Jiang Hu saw through his words and identified inconsistencies immediately. Suddenly, Dou Jiang Hu burst into laughter, remarking casually, It appears my jest was too harsh, isn't it? Understanding Wun Hui's logic that their shared blood cult lineage made them akin to brothers, Dou Jiang Hu expressed his desire to welcome Wun Hui as a cult member to carry on his grandfather's legacy. What is your decision? Will you accept? Wun Hui replied, It would be an honor for me to accept, sir. My grandfather would have been proud as well. Deep down, he thought. I suspected something was amiss, but his sudden laughter put me at ease. At least I am safe now. However, in the end, I made the choice to join the cult willingly. Upon receiving an invitation to join the blood cult at the behest of the blood star, Wun Hui was finally set free. With utmost gratitude, Wun Hui promptly prostrated himself and exclaimed, Praise the blood star, and may the blood cult thrive forever. As Wun Hui departed, still overwhelmed with gratitude and bowing down, Dou Zhang Ho casually remarked, I welcome your return to the cult, Wun Hui. Welcome back. Deep within his heart, Wun Hui whispered, I managed to survive, yet here I am, back in the blood cult. If only I had known this would be the outcome, I would never have refused. Once again, it seems that fate has brought us together, the successor of the blood cult. Wun Hui thought to himself, Du Jiang Ho has offered to grant me one wish. Wun Hui pondered, pondered, why would a blood star be willing to fulfill the request of an ordinary person like me? I am certain that this is a test or a trap to uncover my true intentions. In order to avoid arousing suspicion from Dou Zhang Hu, I must carefully consider my request. Since I am unaware of his true motives, I must ask for something that appears reasonable. Wun Hui responded by expressing his desire to have his old short sword returned, as it holds sentimental value as a keepsake from his mother. Upon hearing the word, keepsake, Dou Zhang Hu seemed to be contemplating something, although he did not reveal any facial expressions. Dou Zhang Hu also requested Captain O oh to return the short sword, but Captain O oh declined, stating that it was the same sword used to kill members of their cult. Before Captain O oh could continue speaking, Li Zheng Ho interjected, instructing Captain O oh not to repeat himself. Without hesitation, Captain O oh promptly handed over Wun Hui's short sword. After receiving Wun Hui's short sword, Dou Zhang Hu examined it and remarked that it appeared quite old, yet still a decent weapon. Unbeknownst to him, Dou Zhang Hu accidentally snapped the tip of Wun Hui's sword with just his two fingers. However, despite returning to the blood cult, Dou Zhang Hu had to face the consequences of his actions as he had shed the blood of their followers. With a swift motion, Dou Zhang Hu flung the broken sword directly at Wun Hui's face. He advised Wun Hui to exercise more caution in wielding his sword in future situations. Witnessing Dou Zhang Ho's effortless flick of the finger that sent Wun Hui's sword flying, Wun Hui couldn't help but think that this sword would have been easily sliced through. Dou Zhang Ho's Kim power was undeniably terrifying. It was undoubtedly a warning to Wun Hui, and he was certain that Dou Zhang Ho would continue to suspect him. However, the most crucial thing at the moment was his own survival. One of the warriors called out to Wun Hui, urging him to get up and follow them without delay. Wun Hui could only decline, requesting to retrieve his sword first. In his heart, he expressed gratitude for being able to reclaim the Sodom sword. He also wondered if the fairy was all right. When Wun Hui's finger made contact with the sword, he was startled by the sudden sound of a fairy screaming and crying. The fairy exclaimed, My hair! Do you see what you've done? How will you fix my hair? It turned out that the broken tip of the sword was actually the fairy's hair. Wun Hui reassured the fairy, saying that he would take the sword to a blacksmith for repairs. However, the fairy angrily expressed her desire to bald Wun Hui as punishment for damaging her hair. She wished she could move freely to carry out her revenge. The fairy then questioned Wun Hui about his affiliation with a cult, to which he replied telepathically explaining that only they could communicate in this manner. The fairy also mentioned that Wun Hui seemed serious about something he wanted to say. Wun Hui admitted that he did come from a cult, 
but it was not entirely true nor entirely false. He asked the fairy if she would believe him if he claimed to be from ten years in the future. The sword fairy was left speechless and confused by Wun Hui's words. In a different location, Do Jiang Hu approached Captain O and issued orders for a covert mission to be executed. Captain O dispatched an individual to travel to Luoyang City and delve into his mother's family background. Inquiring further, Captain O asked if Do Jiang Hu also harbored suspicions. Do Jiang Hu confirmed this to be true. The accuracy of his statements, however, holds no significance. I cannot tolerate his scrutiny of my every move and his ability to track my whereabouts. His behavior resembles that of a seasoned spy, unconcerned with the issue at hand. He possesses an excessive amount of knowledge about our organization, so we must exercise caution. Meanwhile, while en route, Wun Hui recounted his experiences to the Sword Fairy. The Sword Fairy pondered over Wun Hui's narrative and proceeded to summarize his understanding. It appears that you spent a decade working as a spy for a cult, only to be unjustly killed. Upon awakening, you find yourself back in the present. Wun Hui affirmed the accuracy of the Sword Fairy's assessment. The Sword Fairy elaborated, explaining that you are transported back ten years after your demise. It is no surprise that you do not appear foolish, unlike the Wun Hui I once knew, who merely laughed at the Sword Fairy's words upon his resurrection. However, if you consider me to be foolish, then so be it. The Sword Fairy casually remarked that you have encountered misfortune. After enduring such trials in your life, you are sent back ten years to once again fall victim to the cult's clutches. Everything would have proceeded smoothly if only you had left a signal when the cult attacked. Upon hearing the fairy's words regarding leaving Ah Song, Wun Hui immediately asserted that it was impossible for him to do so. He emphasized that Ah Song was the only individual who treated him with humanity throughout his entire life. Even in his past life, when the blood cult attacked, and Ah Song was willing to sacrifice himself to protect Wun Hui. This debt of gratitude was deeply ingrained in Wun Hui's heart. Having repaid this debt by leaving the cult, Wun Hui expressed concern for Ah Song's well-being in the present. In response, the sword fairy questioned Wun Hui's willingness to revert to cowardice after a decade of gathering valuable information as a spy. The fairy reminded Wun Hui that information was a powerful weapon, one that he possessed in abundance. By leveraging his knowledge and experience, Wun Hui had the ability to anticipate and prevent negative outcomes, or even alter them for the better. Wun Hui was taken aback by the sword fairy's words. The fairies speak the truth. Why should I be concerned about survival when I have a decade of experience as a spy? This is indeed a wonderful opportunity, as you mentioned. I must make the most of it. I cannot continue living like this indefinitely. We were so caught up in excitement that we failed to notice our loud conversation. The sword fairy scolded him for being foolish. Cease speaking loudly, or you will arouse suspicion. If any of the special members were to overhear you, I believe I have numerous possibilities. Perhaps I could even expand my knowledge of martial arts. The sword fairy inquired further, asking if he desired to learn martial arts. How can you achieve that when your Dantian has been damaged by the key blast? However, this is not certain information. If it is true, it is a distant prospect. Therefore, I shall set that matter aside for now. The sword fairy proudly offered to assist Wun Hui. Do you think you can harness Qi once more? Would you like me to impart martial arts knowledge, specifically the short sword technique of my previous owner? I was meant to be the sole possessor of that technique. Wun Hui casually declined, seemingly skeptical of the sword fairy's ability to teach martial arts techniques. Learning martial arts from an ancient sword seemed implausible. Feeling slighted, Wun Hui retorted angrily to the sword fairy, citing a proverb about a dog learning poetry in three years. You are far inferior to me. Therefore, heed my words as I elucidate the fundamental principles of martial arts to you. Wun Hui was taken aback as he witnessed his hand emitting blue fire. To his astonishment, he found himself transported to a different dimension. Confused, he questioned his surroundings, only to hear a voice proclaiming that the universe would reveal itself with the possession of the sword's heart. The sword fairy's voice resonated, causing the blue light to intensify and blind Wun Hui momentarily. 
Suddenly he found himself back in front of the sword fairy, pondering the recent events. As he contemplated, the sword fairy scolded him for his lack of attention and understanding. Frustrated, the fairy disappeared, leaving Wun Hui to reflect on his actions and the burning blue flame in his hand. Wun Hui extended his apologies to the sword fairy, expressing his concern for her well-being. The fairy responded with irritation, assuring him that she was simply tired and to disregard it. Wun Hui then placed his body alongside the blood cult captives, pondering the mysterious occurrences he had witnessed. The blue flames he had encountered seemed eerily familiar, reminiscent of his past life's demise. Could this be linked to the enigmatic secrets documented by the Sword Sage? Following a period of travel, the Blood Cult group and their captives eventually reached a hidden location belonging to the cult. Among the prisoners, Wun Hui remained fixated on his left hand, where the blue flame seemed to have vanished. Pondering how to rekindle the mysterious fire, he was interrupted by the sudden halt of the horse-drawn carriage transporting them. A warrior member's voice pierced the air, urging everyone to awaken and exit promptly. Threatening immediate death for any escape attempts, the warriors directed the prisoners to follow their commands without delay. As they were instructed to gather at the front and hasten their pace, the sword elf, just roused from slumber, inquired loudly about their current whereabouts. Wun Hui, who was observant of his surroundings, mentioned that they were currently in a valley known as Eel Sex. Wan Wei elaborated that this valley served as one of the secret bases of the blood cult, where kidnapped children were trained to become specialized soldiers. The sword fairy expressed shock, questioning the presence of educational facilities for kidnapped children. Wun Hui further disclosed that the man on the stage was Commander Gu Sang Wung, the training leader of the Blood Cult Valley, notorious for his harsh treatment of students. Suddenly, a voice called out to Wun Hui, revealing Chua Bek and Wu Hyun. They teased him for acting knowledgeable yet getting caught. Wun Hui simply smiled, acknowledging their successful escape. Deep down, he believed the fate of the black and white twin ghosts was sealed. The voice demanded to know why Wun Hui's hands were free, prompting him to explain his situation. Captain O oh abruptly interrupted the conversation, commanding everyone to stop talking and focus ahead. He warned that if anyone continued to talk, he wouldn't hesitate to kill them on the spot. Pointing behind him, Captain O oh drew attention to the stage and announced that he would count to five, instructing everyone to run towards it. Upon hearing the captain's order, Joabek impulsively suggested, that their hands be untied before they were expected to run. Wun Hui, however, firmly stated that if they wanted to survive, they must follow his lead without question. Wu Yun was taken aback by Wun Hui's words, unable to comprehend his intentions. Confused, Zhuabek requested an explanation, asking what they had been discussing. Wun Hui continued to sprint up the steps of the stage, fully aware of the consequences if he failed to comply with Captain O's orders. As everyone pondered Wun Hui's actions, Captain O promptly signaled the warriors. Wu Hyun expressed a sense of unease, admitting that he had a foreboding feeling. Despite not fully understanding the situation, he suggested they follow the determined young individual. They decided it was best to run swiftly before something dreadful occurred. One of the warriors slowly unsheathed his sword, signaling the start of the massacre from the rear. The prisoners were ruthlessly and indiscriminately killed by the warrior. Wu Hyun and Wu Hui, running together, were taken aback when they glanced back. They couldn't comprehend what was happening. Why were the warriors slaughtering the prisoners in such a brutal manner? What made it even more perplexing was that everything was unfolding exactly as Wu Hui had predicted. After escaping the clutches of the cult warriors' massacre, the three of them finally reached the stage. Zhuabek advised Wu Yun to mimic Wun Hui's actions, despite not fully understanding the situation. However, Zhuabek believed that following Wun Hui's lead would ensure their safety. Commander Gu burst into laughter upon seeing the surviving prisoners. He had never witnessed such an extraordinary event before. It turned out that a young boy had managed to reach this point without following any instructions. A woman standing beside Commander Gu remarked that the boy was the same person mentioned in the captain's report. 
According to the report, he claimed to be a descendant of a follower of the fairy sword cult and had been closely observing Wun Hui's actions. He also seemed to possess an innate understanding of the positions he needed to take without being instructed. It appeared that he truly was a devoted follower of the blood cult. Wun Hui nonchalantly responded, acknowledging that he had to act this way. By openly admitting his lineage to the blood cult, he aimed to divert suspicion away from himself. Additionally, if he hadn't taken such measures, the cult might have taken action and sought someone to use as an example. Hearing Wun Hui's explanation, the sword fairy could only sigh and agree that the situation was indeed troublesome. Commander Gu suddenly raised his voice once more, declaring, Attention! Rejoice! For you have been selected as the chosen one by the will of the Blood Diamond Grid to join the esteemed Blood Cult. Upon hearing Commander Gu's proclamation, the prisoners were immediately taken aback, realizing the gravity of their situation. Panic ensued among them as they understood that they were in the midst of a cult. One of the prisoners bravely spoke out, denouncing the idea that kidnapping and murder could be equated with choosing followers. Observing the tense exchange, the sword fairy acknowledged the truth in the prisoner's words, but questioned whether it was appropriate to voice such opinions in front of the warrior commander. Wun Hui responded to the fairy's query, affirming that he would indeed set an example by adhering to his earlier statement. The sword fairy was taken aback, contemplating whether Wun Hui's notion of setting an example meant that those who opposed or rejected the warrior's commands would face dire consequences. Wun Hui refused to look back, determined to move forward. He also responded to the Sword Fairy's inquiry. Everything was in order. Perhaps it went unnoticed due to our haste, but within the blood cult, the weak were destined to perish. Their reign of terror relied on instilling fear, a method that proved highly effective. Without allowing one of the prisoners to finish speaking, the warrior nonchalantly thrust his sword just above the prisoner's head. After eliminating one of them, he warned the others, Continue babbling if you wish to share his fate. The prisoners immediately fell into silence, witnessing the brutal massacre unfold before their eyes. Observing this gruesome scene, the sword fairy remarked on the irony of the captors going to great lengths to abduct them, only to meet their demise in such circumstances. Curiosity arose within her as she questioned how Wani managed to survive in her previous life. With composure, Wani admitted, I cannot take pride in it, but I survived by obediently following their commands like a loyal dog. Commander Gu raised his voice once again, announcing the commencement of the baptism process. Let us begin with you, standing over there, he pointed out. It was revealed that Commander Gu had been appointed by Wun Hui. Curious, Commander Gu asked the young Wun Hui if he knew the contents of the box. Wun Hui calmly replied that it contained blood parasites, sir. Impressed by Wun Hui's quick response, Commander Gu chuckled and commended his intelligence. He then requested Wun Hui to explain the concept of blood parasites to the prisoners. Wun Hui proceeded to provide a detailed explanation, describing blood parasites as highly toxic organisms implanted in the bodies of new blood-only followers to ensure their loyalty. He further explained that these followers must consume the cult's antidote every 24 hours, as failure to do so would result in the blood parasite tearing their chests apart, leading to their demise. Commander Gu praised Wun Hui for his flawless explanation, acknowledging the immense power possessed by the descendants of the blood cult followers. Zhuabek was taken aback when Commander Gu revealed that Wun Hui himself was a descendant of a blood cult member. Damn it, so you've been a spy for the blood cult all this time, Zhuabek exclaimed in disbelief. The sword fairy whispered to Wun Hui, revealing that he was once a spy. Wun Hui, annoyed by the mockery, asked the fairy to stop. He knew that escaping this problem would be difficult and troublesome. Commander Gu then approached Wun Hui and offered him a chance to prove his bloodline and loyalty to the cult. He promised Wun Hui the pride of being the first person to obtain blood parasites. Before the other prisoners could hear the offer, Wun Hui realized that there was no other way to avoid consuming the parasites. He knew that refusing would result in his death, but he also wanted to be the center of attention. 
In this life, survival was his only choice, even if it meant eating those blood parasites. Wun Hui firmly expressed his gratitude for the opportunity to be first, but politely requested a little water to aid digestion in a different location. Captain O observed Wun Hui from a distance, continuing to monitor the situation. He noticed that Commander Gu was starting to favor the young boy, although his loyalty to the cult was still in question. Captain O chuckled and predicted that the truth would soon be revealed. All preparations had been completed, and they would see the results once Wun Hui finished swallowing the blood parasite. Captain O humbly prostrated himself and praised the diamond, wishing for long life for the blood cult. He expressed his gratitude for the opportunity. Commander Gu also mentioned that it was an appropriate reaction for a descendant of a cult. Now, each of you prisoners will step forward one by one and choose one of these blood parasites. The sword fairy was greatly surprised to see Wun Hui swallow the blood parasite so effortlessly. How did you manage to survive a decade with that blood parasite in your chest? I can only describe feeling this nauseating sensation once again for two weeks. Before Wun Hui could complete his sentence, he suddenly experienced an intense and burning pain in his chest. The sensation of heat in my chest is overwhelming, as if I am being scorched from within. Despite enduring the agony, Wun Hui noticed Captain O oh observing him from afar. The pain felt distinct, yet it was in the exact spot where the blood parasite resided. Blood parasites should not act out without cause, so why is this occurring? Could Captain O oh be responsible for this? What has he done with the blood parasite within his own body? Captain O oh approached the young man slowly, who was clearly in pain. He chuckled and remarked about the blood parasite in his chest suggesting that he was a descendant of a cult. Perplexed, Captain O questioned why the young man was writhing in agony. Wun Hui, feeling helpless, could only surrender to the pain without being able to do anything. Frustrated, he accused Captain O of tampering with the blood parasite he had consumed. Captain O approached him slowly once again, laughing as he mentioned the raging blood parasite in his chest and his connection to the cult. However, he questioned why the young man was looking so distressed. Wun Hui could only remain silent, enduring the pain he was experiencing. Filled with anger, he thought that Captain O oh must have done something to the blood parasite he had given him. Observing the situation, Commander Gu inquired about the condition of the young man, asking if he was all right. Captain O oh assured him that he was fine, explaining that he had likely provoked the blood parasites. Wun Hui, swallowing his pride, couldn't help but wonder how he could have made such a mistake. Captain O oh then instructed Wun Hui to stand up and turn around, promising to calm down the blood parasite. Utilizing his Kai power, he continued, emphasizing that he didn't do it willingly, but rather because the other prisoners were waiting for their turn. Given the circumstances, he urged Wun Hui to quickly comply. Captain O oh assured him that he would help him come up with a plan. Wun Hui couldn't help but notice that the pain had now shifted from his chest to his lower stomach for some unknown reason. When Captain O oh was preparing to eradicate the blood parasite in Wun Hui's body, Wun Hui suddenly interjected, Wait, Captain, I'm perfectly fine. Please step away from behind me. Upon hearing Wun Hui's words, Captain O oh questioned, What are you talking about? You will be permanently injured if we don't proceed. If only the parasite had been in a different location. Captain O readied himself once again and instructed, Prepare yourself. Tense your lower abdomen. Straighten your back. Wun Hui, who had just surrendered, continued to endure the excruciating pain. He was certain that this feeling couldn't be mistaken. I have to put a stop to this, Wun Hui softly pleaded. Step back, Captain O. I can't bear it any longer. Suddenly, a dreadful sound reverberated through the air. Upon hearing the powerful sound, Captain O was left dumbfounded. In a hushed tone, he remarked, Didn't I tell you that I was fine, Captain? Witnessing this incident, the sword fairy couldn't help but burst into laughter. I never expected you to pass gas like that. The more I think about it, the funnier it becomes. Thank you for lifting my spirits. Amidst the sword fairy's incessant laughter, Wun Hui implored, Stop laughing, I don't feel well. The blood parasite in my body feels peculiar. The pain has completely vanished, and the tightness in my chest has also disappeared. 
Zhuabek approached Wun Hui abruptly. Greetings, loyal follower of the blood cult. What course of action do you propose now? Is your silence intentional? Perhaps to gain favor with the higher authorities present here? Upon hearing Zhuabek's words, Wun Hui retorted, Are you out of your mind? Why would I willingly remain here for an extended period of time? I yearn to escape this place as swiftly as possible. Suddenly, Captain O commanded attention. O oh, prisoners, we shall now commence an evaluation test to determine your rank level. Maintain silence and refrain from any action unless instructed otherwise. Simply listen. The sword fairy inquired of Wun Hui, Why is Captain O always present here? Wun Hui responded that he was the captain responsible for overseeing this test in my previous life. Captain O proceeded with his words, gesturing towards the back. The test is fairly straightforward. Do you see the caves behind me? Within each cave, an examiner from our esteemed group awaits. Your task is to undergo assessment by them. Once the test concludes, you shall receive a board indicating your level based on the results. Strive to achieve a high rank for this curse does not accommodate feeble individuals. Captain O proudly displayed his waist belt, showcasing a blue symbol of his status as one of the top warriors in the cult. This belt signifies strength and achievement, earned through recognition as a high-ranking warrior. Those who prove themselves on missions will be freed from the control of blood parasites. Strive for recognition and strength, and you shall receive a special gift. The prisoners were taken aback by Captain O's words, as Dwabek promised to rid them of the blood parasites. To attain a high rank, one must become a powerful warrior. Wun Hui observed quietly, realizing the prisoner's newfound hope. Unbeknownst to them, their loyalty to the cult would only deepen over time. Upon witnessing the prisoner's reaction, Captain O oh reprimanded them for being noisy. Wun Hui noticed a whistle in Captain O's hand and instinctively covered his ears. As Captain O oh blew the whistle, he was surprised by Wun Hui's reaction. The prisoners, in agony, cried out for help. The sword fairy, witnessing the chaos, expressed concern for their well-being, questioning the sudden change in behavior. Upon hearing Captain O's statement, Dwabek spoke softly, expressing his reluctance to live with a blood parasite for the rest of his life. The sword fairy then remarked to Wun Hui that perhaps he didn't feel the pain because he had covered his ears. Wun Hui countered by stating that even with covered ears, the blood parasite in one's body could still hear. He further added that he was not completely certain, but he felt as though the blood parasites were no longer present in his chest. Zhuabek, who stood by Wun Hui, mentioned that consuming the blood parasites meant they could no longer escape. Despite Wun Hui's intelligence, Zhuabek asserted his strength over him, emphasizing his determination to achieve a high rank and rid himself of the parasite for revenge. Wun Hui remained silent, observing Bak's soul's reaction. When Captain O began assigning the order for the test, Guabek eagerly volunteered to go first. The sword fairy whispered to Wun Hui, causing him to become angry. His anger stemmed from the fact that Wun Hui had failed to inform him about the whistle beforehand. As they continued on their journey, they encountered a group of Bak souls who were the first to be welcomed. Wun Hui ran swiftly, determined to keep up with the pace. Suddenly, he heard someone calling out to him. It was Captain O oh who exclaimed, Look, Wun Hui, I don't need your help. I will prove that I am superior to you. Before Captain O oh could finish his sentence, a powerful punch was directed towards his face. In addition, Captain O oh also stated, Hey, you bastard, are you deaf? I explicitly told you not to act as you please. Wait for your turn. You can only move when I give the order. You are only allowed to speak and act under the command of your boss. Furthermore, Captain O oh appointed Wun Hui as the first person to undertake the test. Addressing Wun Hui, he said, You are Wun Hui from the Radiant Earth Clan. You will be the first to undergo this test. Why are you silent? Is this the proud descendant of the saints? Wun Hui felt a sense of fear and was certain that Captain O oh had something planned. It seemed that Captain O oh would pose a challenge in the future. Wun Hui realized that life was not easy in the present moment. He respectfully bowed and saluted, expressing his fear. He replied, Of course not, sir. I am simply surprised by your consideration and kindness. With that, 
Wun Hui entered the cave. In my past life, I was evaluated by the captain. Little did I know that I would undergo this assessment once more. The sword fairy continued to accompany Wun Hui into the cave. It's not as if you didn't possess a Dantian previously. So what rank did you receive? Wun Hui casually replied that it was evident. Naturally, I received the low rank. Individuals with a low rank will only end up as punching bags in perilous missions. Suddenly, a voice was heard. It stated that you are so Wun Hui from Luoyang City. Wun Hui, upon hearing the voice, was taken aback. So this is what the scoundrel had planned. He was indeed easier than in my previous life. However, there is no doubt that it's him. The sword fairy inquired once more if you recognized him. I know precisely who he is. He was my superior in my past life when I was part of the Wolf Blood Squad. He is the individual I informed Dojang Hu about. The captain of the Wolf Blood, No Sung Gu, asked again, Why did you not respond? I asked if you were so Wun Hui from Luoyang City. Wun Hui pondered once more, Captain O, oh, your scheme is clever, but it's unfortunate that I have outsmarted four cult leaders since yesterday. Even deceiving someone I have never met before is easier than tricking someone I already know. It was quite simple in my previous life. Wun Hui replied accurately, My master is Wun Hui, a descendant of Radiant Earth from Luoyang City. You are the captain of the Wolf Blood Squad. I have heard numerous stories about you from my grandfather. No Sung Gu confidently unsheathed his sword, deliberately fabricating a falsehood. He asserted, you claimed that your grandfather belonged to the esteemed Wolfblood Squad. But I must inform you that there is no warrior within that squad who shares your grandfather's identity. Captain No Sung Gu swiftly strangled Wun Hui's neck, implying that Wun Hui wanted to die, as he had mentioned his grandfather's connection to Captain No's father. Having trained with the Wolf Blood Squad since childhood, Captain No remembered all the soldiers under his father's command. Witnessing Wun Hui being strangled, Sword Panic quickly assessed if he could fight Captain No alone. Realizing the situation would worsen if he used his sword, Sword Panic decided to try persuading Captain No instead. Suddenly, the Sword Fairy alerted Wun Hui of an attack from below. Wun Hui skillfully blocked Captain No's attack with his short sword. However, Captain No's assault continued as he swiftly kicked Wun Hui, causing him to be thrown backwards. Wun Hui, feeling the impact of the attack, feared his back might break. He marveled at Captain No's incredible speed and realized he couldn't endure much longer in his current state. Concerned for Wun Hui, the sword fairy asked if he was all right, noticing the bleeding from his head. Wun Hui assured the fairy that the attack wasn't a reflection of Captain No's cruel nature but he felt a bit dizzy and struggled to concentrate. In response, the sword fairy informed Wun Hui that Captain No would attack again and instructed him to move and repel the attacks when prompted. Wun Hui deftly deflected Captain No's horizontal attack aimed at his neck. Despite successfully blocking the strike, Wun Hui's body was so rigid that he was pushed back once more. Captain No was taken aback by how Wun Hui managed to endure his assaults twice. As Wun Hui attempted to rise, he noticed that his sword had been flung far away. I narrowly escaped death a second time. Thank you, sword fairy, for aiding me, he muttered gratefully. Just as Wun Hui began to lower his guard, Captain No swiftly pressed down on him, causing him to stumble while wielding his sword menacingly. Now tell me, Captain No demanded sternly, where did you learn about me and the wolf blood squad? Wun Hui simply chuckled. This is my chance, he thought to himself. He intended to play along with the interrogation and replied, Captain No, don't you wish to reunite with your beloved little sister? Upon hearing Wun Hui's statement, Captain No was taken aback. My dear sister, it seems that you have thoroughly investigated me, leaving no stone unturned. Captain No proceeded to express his astonishment. However, it appears that you overlooked the fact that my only brother has passed away. Wun Hui promptly revealed that Miss Sehua was, in fact, still alive. When your father was murdered, Miss Sehua was abducted. Are you aware of the bodies found at the crime scene? Why was it only the landlady's body that was consumed by the fire? Startled by Wun Hui's words, Captain No was greatly surprised and urged him to continue. Wun Hui confidently asserted that the body was, in reality, a counterfeit. 
Mrs. Rent is alive and well. If you wish to uncover the truth, let us strike a deal. He remained silent for a brief moment before swiftly positioning his sword near Wun Hui's neck. He remarked that it seemed Wun Hui even knew his name based on what he had witnessed. It appeared that Wun Hui had not succeeded in intimidating him. However, he cunningly stated that he had deceived Wun Hui. He expressed his willingness to listen to Wun Hui's explanation and consider striking a deal. Once he had heard the explanation, he requested Wun Hui to disclose the current whereabouts of the lease. In a composed manner, Wun Hui responded that Mrs. Sewa was now a part of the Lunar Flower Merchant Troop. Captain No also mentioned that the Lunar Flower Troop was owned by the First Blood Star, who was none other than Jiang Ryong, the mastermind behind his father's demise. He questioned whether Jiang Ryong's statement was true. Addressing Captain No, he acknowledged that all of this was orchestrated to provoke his anger and manipulate the Wolf Blood Army, all part of Jiang Ryong's plan. Captain No expressed disbelief, stating that it was all implausible and lacked coherence. However, before Captain No could continue, Wun Hui casually asked if he was truly observing the situation with his own eyes. He revealed that the retrieval and examination of his father's body had been handled by Bunga Bulan and Commander Clear Moon. Witnessing Captain No's reaction, he noticed his hesitation and subsequent silence. Wun Hui proceeded with his statement. Presently, Mrs. Sewa is located at the Gyumhai branch, which is affiliated with the Lunar Flower Merchant Troop in Zhejiang. There may be numerous spies in that area, therefore I kindly request that you send a reliable individual to investigate. Wun Hui nonchalantly added, If my previous remarks have convinced you to consider an agreement, I implore you, sir, to assist me just this once when I require your assistance. Captain No extended his hand and remarked, I wish all your claims were false. Regardless of your whereabouts, I will track you down and promptly put an end to your schemes. Wun Hui calmly responded, Sir, I have already risked my life by consuming blood parasites. Is that not sufficient for you? I sincerely hope you locate your sister soon, sir. As Captain No helped Wun Hui to his feet, he expressed, I still harbor doubts about placing complete trust in you. However, if your words hold true, I am willing to overlook our past differences. I will forever regard you as my savior. Wun Hui gratefully replied, Thank you, sir. Your generosity is truly remarkable. He silently acknowledged, This is why I was able to place my trust in Captain No and follow him in my previous life. Upon examining the object given to him by Captain No, Wun Hui discovered that he had received a grade of moderate rank. The captain claimed that he hadn't given it to him as part of their agreement, but acknowledged that Wun Hui deserved it for successfully defending against two of his attacks. He speculated that Wun Hui had inherited his grandfather's personality. In response, Wun Hui questioned whether Captain No would believe him if he confirmed that to be true. Captain No, amused, remarked that he never mentioned Wun Hui's grandfather's name, and yet Wun Hui readily provided the information under pressure. Reflecting on the situation, Captain No realized that he had fallen into Wun Hui's trap. He admitted, I don't know what you have planned, but for now, I trust you. He then escorted Wun Hui out of the cave. The sword fairy expressed relief, mentioning that she had feared something terrible would happen after being thrown far away. She marveled at Wun Hui's composure in such a tense situation, noting that he seemed much older than he appeared. She also acknowledged that his earlier move, even if she considered it lucky, was impressive. However, when he parried for the second time, he managed to deflect the attack with his eyes closed and at a slightly slower pace. If he is able to sense my energy, I am at a loss for an explanation. It seems highly unlikely, almost as if someone was assisting him. Captain No re-entered the cave, and as he walked, he mentioned that my mind had wandered for unknown reasons but I certainly didn't mind it. Outside the captain's cave, a shout was heard, instructing everyone to line up based on their rank. The individuals in the middle range should follow me. Guabek was taken aback when he saw Wun Hui approaching Captain O. Oh. He questioned how it could be possible for Wun Hui to be in the middle rank, just like him, despite being much weaker. Wun Hui, upon hearing Guabek's remarks, could only laugh, 
and proudly display the middle rank he had achieved. It is evident that the prisoners have now aligned themselves with the blood cult. They followed Captain O to the designated location. Dwabek expressed his frustration at the situation, questioning how it all came to be. Despite pondering over it multiple times, he still couldn't comprehend it. Dwabek then pointed out that Wun Hui lacks a Dantian, yet managed to achieve the same middle rank as him. He speculated whether Wun Hui received preferential treatment due to being a descendant of the cult. Dwabek vowed to emerge victorious in the next test, refusing to be defeated by someone without a Dantian like Wun Hui. Observing Dwabek's irritated reaction towards Wun Hui, the sword fairy quietly remarked to Wun Hui that the man was determined to best him. Wun Hui had been silently listening all along, finding the situation quite bothersome. Both individuals were overly reactive because they knew they couldn't challenge me. The sword fairy inquired about Wun Hui's thoughts, prompting a smile from Wun Hui. He understood the implications of their behavior. The sword fairy identified Captain O oh as the one who was closely monitoring Wun Hui, particularly after his encounter with Captain No Sung Gu. Wun Hui casually mentioned witnessing a meeting between Captain O oh and Captain No, where the former was informed of Wun Hui's lineage. Despite Captain O's reluctance to accept it, the sword fairy found amusement in Wun Hui's revelation. It appeared as though he actually consumed it, as if he devoured your flatulence. However, what steps will you take while grasping his stomach? Wun Hui inquired. At the moment, it appears that I must seek out opportunities to enhance my Dan. I am unwilling to squander this chance. The sword fairy reiterated your statement from yesterday. But how can you mend your Dantian? Is it possible? Wun Hui persisted. Have you ever heard of an extraordinary specialist physician? He possesses the ability to cure any ailment. He will provide treatment for you, if you compensate him. According to the rumors I've heard, he once successfully treated and restored someone's injured Dantian. And every ten months, an extraordinary specialist physician visits the Eel Sea Valley. The sword fairy pondered once more, so you will pay him and he will heal you. However, you have left all your money at the inn. After the assault by the cult members, I knew you had nothing left except me. While fiercely striking Wun Hui, the sword fairy uttered, You ungrateful wretch, you're willing to sell me your mother's only legacy just for the sake of treating your Dantian. Despite resisting the sword fairy's attack, Wun Hui pleaded, It's not what you think. I obtained the necessary funds by collecting medicinal plants for ten months. A highly skilled doctor will arrive soon, and he will inquire about the whereabouts of those plants. In my previous life, I already knew their location. Upon hearing Wun Hui's explanation, the sword fairy finally felt relieved. He chuckled and remarked, You truly are clever and meticulous. You've orchestrated all of this. Wun Hui responded, Given the circumstances, there's no harm in me attempting to elevate my status within the blood cult. In the end, they are all human beings just like us. Corrupt individuals remain corrupt regardless of their background. It is irrelevant whether they belong to a traditional or unorthodox group. While en route to the designated location, the captain abruptly halted the journey. He inquired about the cause of the numerous severe injuries present. Who is responsible for this? To everyone's surprise, a man of considerable stature was seen strangling another individual. He nonchalantly remarked that the locals were feeble. Nothing seems to satisfy him. The large man then turned around and chuckled, indicating that fresh prey had arrived. Witnessing this, Captain O swiftly readied himself. He instructed everyone to take cover behind him, declaring that he would confront the assailant. Before he could finish speaking, the colossal man swiftly closed the distance and seized Captain O's arm. Leave, he commanded. You are in my way. With a single strike, Captain O crumpled to the ground rendered unconscious. The shocking events left onlookers in disbelief, deeming the situation utterly absurd. Even a highly ranked Captain O could be taken down with a single strike. It was unfathomable for a master of such caliber to face such a defeat. It seemed impossible for any commander to achieve such a feat. The true identity of the individual remained a mystery. In all my years, I have never encountered a master possessing such immense strength. Wun Hui, still in shock, muttered, He's too powerful. 
His mere presence instilled fear in those around him, as his intimidating aura was palpable. The imposing figure then clapped his hands, causing a sudden shift in the atmosphere. The sound was so deafening that it caused excruciating pain to those in close proximity. With a nonchalant demeanor, he remarked that a single clap could result in a thousand casualties. What a disappointment, he sneered, likening them to mere trash. The sword elf was filled with panic as he witnessed the incident unfold before him. Concerned for Wu Hui's well-being, he urgently called out, Wu Hui, are you all right? Can you hear me? The applause that followed was truly terrifying, causing immense pain. Clutching his ears, he exclaimed, My eardrums feel like they're about to burst. Despite the deafening noise, he could still hear nothing around him. It was evident that Wu Hui's ears had started to bleed, and he began to feel nauseous. However, suddenly, a searing heat surged through his chest, bringing about a completely different sensation. His ears stopped ringing and all his wounds began to heal. Meanwhile, Huabek nervously stood before the imposing figure, boldly stating, Try to kill me. Until you can defeat me, you won't lay a finger on my sister. The big man merely laughed, amused by Huabek's reaction. In a swift motion, he threw a powerful punch at Huabek's head, rendering him unconscious with a single blow. Observing the dire situation, Wun Hui realized that he had to escape if he wanted to survive. Uncertain of what awaited him, he made the decision to flee before it was too late. The big man chuckled once more, realizing that there was still one more victim left. With lightning speed, he appeared behind Wun Hui and mercilessly attacked him with a swift kick. Commander Gu's voice rang out, rousing Captain O oh from his slumber. What has occurred here? he inquired. I rushed over when you failed to arrive at our designated meeting spot. Upon my arrival, I witnessed numerous new soldiers wounded, some gravely so. What transpired? Captain O responded, I apologize, Commander. A wild individual suddenly appeared and launched an assault on us. Although I am somewhat embarrassed to admit it, he proved to be overwhelmingly powerful, rendering me unconscious with a single blow. He was a burly man with disheveled hair, clad in attire fashioned from tiger skin. Upon hearing Captain O's account, Commander Gu remarked, It appears that the individual who incapacitated you and apprehended your subordinates was none other than Elder Evil Heaven, one of the four venerable figures. Have you heard of him? Captain O was taken aback. Are you suggesting that the imposing figure is Evil Heaven? Commander Gu elaborated, revealing that Evil Heaven had recently taken up residence in Eel Valley. You were unaware due to your duties keeping you occupied. He is a formidable member of the cult of the Four Venerable Ones, known for his sinister nature. Evil Heaven chuckled nonchalantly as he brandished Wu Hui's sword. Are you searching for this? He taunted. I had heard that the new recruits were lacking in strength, yet here is someone wielding a blade like this. What is truly remarkable is that this individual possesses no internal energy, as his Dantian has been destroyed. Despite this, he withstood my attack and you were the first to regain consciousness. Quite intriguing indeed. Commander Gu and Captain O oh were spotted ascending a steep cliff. Captain O, oh, who was accompanying Commander Gu, expressed his regret by saying, I apologize, sir. This entire situation is a result of my carelessness. Captain O oh reiterated, Please do not tell me that Hei Akion was responsible for their deaths. They were inexperienced and held moderate ranks. It would be quite challenging to handle. I am uncertain about Wun Hui, but if it were the twins, they might have been in the highest rank. Upon hearing this, Commander Gu responded, I am still unaware of what transpired with them. All I know is that Hei Akion could arrive here at any moment. However, I did not anticipate that he would target novices. Captain O, oh, we will soon reach his abode. I implore you to refrain from making any peculiar remarks. It appeared that they had reached the entrance of a rather sizable cave. Commander Gu once again remarked, Among the four venerable individuals, he was the most challenging to handle. Subsequently, the governor commander saluted. Standing before the grand cave, he declared that everyone must submit to the blood diamond. May the blood cult reign over the world, Hei Akion. I am Commander Gu Sang Wung, responsible for overseeing all the novices of Cycle Valley. Not a sound emanated from the cave. 
After paying their respects to Hai Akion, the supreme elder of evil heaven, Captain O began to grow agitated. He proposed, Commander Gu, shall we enter directly and investigate in person? In response, Commander Gu promptly replied, No, we shall remain here and wait. It would not bode well if we were to disturb him. Before Commander Gu could continue speaking, a sudden data attack emerged from within the cave. Commander Gu deftly deflected the attack with his sword. What caught Commander Gu off guard was that the strike that landed on his sword was merely a seed. Witnessing Commander Gu's swift response, Hei Akion chuckled at his quick reflexes. You're quite skilled, Hei Akion remarked. Upon hearing Hei Akion's compliment, Commander Gu humbly replied, I am not worthy of such praise from you, sir. I am merely a humble insect in your presence. Hei Akion inquired further. Then why are you here? Is it for these children? Bowing his head, Commander Gu answered, Yes, sir. We aim to nurture and train them into warriors for our cause. Hei Akion then exclaimed, Are you concerned that I may harm these children? I find them to be quite exceptional. I plan to impart some self-defense techniques to them while they are under my care. You need not worry. Commander Gu was taken aback by Hei Akion's words, thinking that he intended to personally train the children. Commander Gu expressed, I understand, sir. I hope your intentions are truly for their safety. It would be an honor if you were to take them as your disciples. However, Hei Akion clarified, Do not mistake my intentions. I have no desire to take them as my students. I simply seek companionship and wish to alleviate my solitude here. Captain O, oh, who overheard the conversation, pondered on Hei Akion's decision not to take the children as his disciples. The opportunity to learn directly from a master of self-defense could have been transformative for them. Yet, they were to be taught by another esteemed figure, without any inquiry. Wun Hui, I will not allow you to seize that golden opportunity. Captain O oh then proceeded to inform Ohai Akion that one of the individuals he brought, named Su Wun Hui, had a damaged Dantian. Captain O oh expressed his belief that Su Wun Hui was not deserving of direct teaching. Before he could finish his statement, an unexpected attack struck him, causing him to be thrown backwards and ultimately fall into a ravine. Despite the situation, Hei Akion, with a laugh, reiterated his decision and instructed Captain O oh to leave immediately. Commander Gu, feeling regretful about losing the twins, quickly excused himself and resigned. He believed that despite their potential, it was necessary to part ways with them. However, he saw potential in using So Wun Hui as a spy for the Muram Alliance due to his lineage from the Radiant Earth Clan. Wun Hui, who overheard their conversation, pondered on the situation. Hai Akion, the supreme evil heaven fourth, was the one who had taught Zhua Bek and Wu Yun to become martial arts experts in my previous life. However, I still couldn't comprehend why he had taken me as well. Suddenly, Hai Akion spoke up expressing his hunger after conversing with them. Wun Hui, find me some food immediately, he commanded, emphasizing that I had been given four hours to complete the task and warning me not to even consider running away. He continued, issuing a chilling threat that if I dared to escape and he caught me, I would face unimaginable consequences. Hearing his menacing words, fear coursed through my body. Did he truly believe that I wouldn't attempt to flee simply because he had instructed me not to? I decided to play along, patiently waiting for the perfect moment when his guard was down. At that opportune time, I would make my escape. Wun Hui humbly knelt down and expressed his willingness to fulfill the task. However, he admitted that he lacked the proficiency in martial arts techniques. Moreover, he mentioned the challenge of providing food for the master without his weapon, as the only possession he had left was the short sword passed down to him by his late mother. Unexpectedly, Hei Akion swiftly hurled Wun Hui's sword towards his head, remarking on its insignificance and slyly calling him sneaky. Disoriented by the sudden attack, Wun Hui heard the agonizing cry of the sword fairy, who had been used by the old master for unpleasant purposes. Hei Akion then proceeded to wake up Zhuabek and Wu Yun by forcefully striking them. Expressing his frustration, he questioned their prolonged slumber and declared his intention to rescue them from their current situation. 
Before departing, Heiakian instructed Wun Hui to ensure they had meat for their journey. Wun Hui was taken aback by the sudden gust of wind that swept through him. To his surprise, he found himself standing on a towering cliff. He requested for food to be brought to him within four hours, but it took him the same amount of time just to descend to the base. The sword fairy pointed out to Wun Hui, urging him to observe. The elderly man leaped an impressive distance. Escaping from someone like him seemed impossible. If you attempt to flee, he will easily track you down. Wun Hui was spotted trying to descend the steep cliff, only to abruptly plummet. The sword fairy remarked on his good fortune, surviving the fall from such a height. Despite the pain, it would expedite his descent. Four hours later, Wun Hui had yet to reach the ravine's bottom. Suddenly, He Akian's voice echoed, expressing disbelief that he was still lingering. It appeared that he had disregarded the warning, now seemingly prepared to meet his demise. Wun Hui was spotted hunting at the edge of the forest, stalking a rabbit with a sturdy body. Using an arrow, he skillfully shot the rabbit. Wun Hui, known for receiving daily food assignments from Hei Akeon, successfully caught the rabbit. The sword elves cheered, exclaiming, Great shot, Wun Hui! You're right on target! Impressed by his archery skills, the sword fairy praised him, to which Wun Hui humbly replied, I've been living like this for two months. I should be able to do that by now, having been used to Hei Akeon's training. Recalling a past incident where Wun Hui almost fell off a cliff, the sword fairy remarked, I thought you were a goner back then. You should have given up at the right time. Wun Hui acknowledged his past struggles, mentioning that finding more prey might prevent further beatings. Suddenly, He Akion arrived, prompting Wun Hui to greet him respectfully and explain that he was about to deliver the rabbit. During the act of paying his respects, Wun Hui presented his catch to He Akion and respectfully addressed him as Sir. It appears that tonight's meal will consist of rabbits. Upon receiving the hunted rabbit, He Akion suggested that they examine the two rabbits to ensure there would be enough to feed all four individuals. It seems that one person will have to go without. Suddenly, without warning, He Akion struck Wun Hui, rendering him unconscious. After a brief period of unconsciousness, Wun Hui regained consciousness only to find himself suspended from a tree. He muttered to himself, expressing his lack of surprise at finding himself in this predicament once again. He also expressed his growing weariness and his confusion regarding Hei Akion's motives. There must be a reason why Hei Akion consistently subjects him to such treatment. Wun Hui continued to ponder his situation, reflecting on the past two months of his life, which he likened to that of a slave. He recounted the dangerous climbs up and down cliffs that could easily result in his demise. He also mentioned the constant hunting in the forest to procure food, which often led to physical abuse from Hai Akion. If he failed to bring back food, or if he woke up after being beaten, he knew he would inevitably find himself hanging from that very tree once again. The fairy with the sword who heard Wun Hui's grievances remarked, It's not as if you were always complaining. The first time you were hanging here trying to untie your feet, I felt a rush of blood to my head making me dizzy. Now I've grown accustomed to it. Whether it's a beating or hanging here, it's all the same. Suddenly, Huabek appeared and chided, Hey, Wun Hui, you still can't bring food home properly. Wu Yun and I always end up getting punished by Hayakion for no reason. It's all because of you. Upon hearing Huabek's words, Wun Hui simply chuckled and replied, Yes, you'll definitely get punished too, even when I'm not around. The defender's spirit casually mentioned, Heiakion is looking for you. Hurry up and go meet him. Upon hearing his name being called, Wun Hui thought to himself, I have a bad feeling about this. What does he want from me? At this moment, standing in front of Hai Akion, Hai Akion commanded, Swiftly, remove your garments at once. I desire to witness it. Wun Hui, who was given instructions by Hai Akion, had no choice but to comply. Wun Hui slowly undressed pondering why this sudden request had arisen. What could be going through his mind? While observing Wun Hui's robust physique, He Akion remarked, It has been two months, and it appears that you are nearly prepared. Wun Hui, upon hearing He Akion's words, contemplated the meaning behind them. 
I do not comprehend. Perhaps I should adhere to his wishes. He Akion chuckled and declared that it was now Wun Hui's duty to hunt for sustenance. Zhuabek, upon hearing this, immediately refuted Hai Akion's statement. Why should I? That is supposed to be that wretched Wun Hui's responsibility. Zhuabek did not have the opportunity to finish his words. Suddenly, a forceful kick was aimed directly at his face, causing him to be forcefully propelled backwards. After delivering the kick, Hei Akion warned, Do not defy my commands. If you wish to avoid death, simply do as I have instructed. Hei Akion then reiterated his desire to leave, instructing Wu Yun to cook the food properly and not eat it before his return. While Wun Hui observed Wu Yun, Hei Akion swiftly pulled him out of the cave. With remarkable agility, Hei Akion effortlessly leaped over the steep cliff. Those who are treated in such a manner, he requested, sir, may we simply walk. I am unable to proceed in this manner. With a strong push, Hei Akion promptly tossed Wun Hui into a lake. He also remarked that Wun Hui had been talking too much and that he was taking action because Wun Hui lacked finesse. Wun Hui attempted to emerge from the lake and asked, Sir, why do you persist in treating me this way? Upon witnessing Wun Hui's reaction, Hei Akion chuckled. He mentioned that they would encounter someone who would become Wun Hui's mentor. It would be impolite to meet him with a soiled body. The sword fairy whispered to Wun Hui, who seemed oblivious to the fact that he was the filthiest person on earth. Hei Akion once again urged them to hasten their pace, indicating that it was time to move on. We risk being late if we tarry here bathing any longer. After cleansing himself, Wun Hui proceeded to follow Hai Akion into a cave. The sword fairy mentioned that she hadn't anticipated the existence of a large cave beneath the waterfall. It made me wonder who might have inhabited this cave. Perhaps it could be someone who prefers to remain unseen by others. Alternatively, it could be a master of great beauty who lives in seclusion. Upon hearing the sword fairy's words, Wun Hui expressed disbelief, as he hadn't expected to encounter someone who would seek help to make him a student. He was certain that this person must be just as extraordinary as the sword fairy. At that moment, Hai Akion paused and addressed someone sitting in front of him, stating that they were prepared. He then turned to Wun Hui and urged him to quickly show his respect to the person in front of them, as he would be Wun Hui's master from now on. Without hesitation, Wun Hui knelt down to pay his respects, uttering words of reverence for the blood diamond and the longevity of the blood cult. As a middle-class warrior from the main cult, I, Wun Hui, humbly greet you, my master. The elven warrior who witnessed Wun Hui paying his respects to his master noticed that his master was no longer alive. He pondered if the skeleton before him could actually speak. Wun Hui, taken aback by the revelation, questioned the situation, asking if it was a joke. Hai Akion, amused by Wun Hui's reaction, assured him that it was no jest. He pointed out the improvements in Wun Hui's physical abilities over the past two months, attributing them to his training methods. Hei Akion emphasized the importance of building strength and endurance through various exercises, including climbing rocks and hunting for food. He then elaborated on his intentions to teach Wun Hui martial arts, highlighting the significance of physical fitness in mastering combat skills. After listening to Hei Akion's detailed explanation, Wun Hui expressed, Excuse me, sir, but I must confess that I lost my love at a young age due to my uncontrollable Kai. The distressed individual revealed this information. Hei Akion chuckled once more and retorted, do you truly believe I observed you without understanding your physical state? Am I that foolish? How would you react if I informed you that there is a method to harness internal energy without relying on the Dantian? Wun Hui, upon hearing this, was taken aback. He pondered on the possibility of manipulating internal energy without relying on the Dantian. Is there truly such a method? Ha Akion then inquired, Have you ever heard of Jungishin? This, he explained, is the first concept one must grasp when delving into martial arts. Chuckling, Hai Akion elaborated that Jung signifies fine grains of rice, and in the realm of martial arts, Jungishin refers to the Dantian. By cultivating the Dantian, one can gather internal energy through energy circulation points, refining the Dantian in the process. 
However, due to the destruction of your Dantian, you are unable to access your Jingushin. All that remains for you are energy and your physical body. Do you comprehend the nature of energy? Wun Hui silently absorbed Hayakian's words, questioning why the old man was discussing a topic known to all martial artists. An uneasy feeling crept over him as he contemplated the control of internal energy. Wun Hui then remarked that what Hei Akian referred to was origin energy. Hei Akian chuckled once more, remarking that Wun Hui's understanding was lacking. He clarified that while origin energy was not incorrect, the most precise term for the energy located in the center of one's chest is the innate energy core. This core energy is inherent from birth and cannot be accumulated. It is believed that a person possesses two powers, derived from the internal energy accumulated through the core energy. While chuckling, Hei Akion uttered the phrase indicating your immense fortune. These words were crafted to impart the knowledge of controlling one's inner energy. Moreover, listening to Hei Akion's profound explanation regarding the bestowal of the sword brought immense joy. He exclaimed, Wun Hui, you have struck gold. With this, you can once again delve into the realm of martial arts. However, I can't help but notice your lack of happiness. Are you planning to squander this golden opportunity? Pun elucidated to the sword fairy that innate core energy, as the name suggests, is the life force essential for one's survival. Martial artists only utilize their innate core energy in one specific scenario, when they choose to sacrifice themselves alongside their adversaries. Once depleted, this energy cannot be replenished. If I continue to exhaust it, my lifespan will be significantly shortened. Wun Hui continued. If I acquire this knowledge and persist in utilizing my original energy, my time left to live will be greatly diminished. Wun Hui pondered once more over Hei Akian's words. You old fool! Do you honestly believe that I would find happiness and excitement in something that could potentially lead to my demise? I refuse to comply. While still kneeling, Wun Hui spoke. O oh, Hai Akian, I am truly grateful for the invaluable teachings you have bestowed upon me. However, there is something I cannot comprehend with my feeble mind. After experiencing energy deviation, I have lost my Dantian, and they claim I possess no talent. Even during my time in class this was the case, I implore you to reconsider teaching me. After hearing Wun Hui's words, Hei Akian contemplated. I have endured countless hardships to assist you in refining your physical abilities, only to discover that you possess no talent whatsoever, he thought. Hei Akion chuckled once more and remarked, I am aware that you possess knowledge of martial arts, being from a martial arts clan yourself. Do you believe I am oblivious to your attempts to avoid learning this? You are well aware that by doing so, your original energy will be depleted. Wun Hui was taken aback by Hai Akion's revelation, as he had not yet voiced his concerns. Hai Akion swiftly and decisively strangled Wun Hui, emphasizing the importance of understanding the proper way to act. Failure to learn would render Wun Hui useless. Hai Akion believed his words to be true. With an intense gaze, Hai Akion presented two options to Wun Hui. Either release his grip and let him die instantly, or learn and suffer a slow death. Wun Hui firmly pleaded to be killed, expressing his desire to die. Upon hearing this, Hei Akian questioned Wun Hui's regard for his own life. He wondered if anyone would blame him for killing someone with a damaged Dantian, especially someone of Wun Hui's low martial arts level, who would rather die than submit to him. Wun Hui expressed his concerns, stating that he would rather die than live according to Hei Akian's words, as he had a blood parasite in his body. Hai Akion, in response, laughed and accused Wun Hui of lying even in such a serious situation. He emphasized that he had been aware of Wun Hui's condition from the beginning and expected him to behave accordingly. Hai Akion firmly stated that he prioritized other matters over the issue of blood parasites. Wun Hui pondered on Hai Akion's words after hearing his perspective. If his intention was truly to kill me from the beginning, he would have done so upon discovering that there were no blood parasites in my body. There must have been a motive behind his actions, something that I was unaware of. It seems to be connected to his goal of teaching me something. Hai Akion then reiterated, 
offering me something that might pique my interest as compensation for following his instructions. He assured me that the absence of blood parasites in my body would not pose a problem once I learned what he had to teach. All I needed to do was confront Chwabek and Wahin in combat, as they would be the ones to instruct me in martial arts. Wun Hui was taken aback by Hai Akion's words. He attempted to inquire further, seeking understanding, but Hai Akion swiftly interjected, warning him that he would break his legs if he persisted with unnecessary questions. Hai Akion believed he had deciphered Wun Hui's thoughts and expected him to comply with his orders. He instructed Wun Hui to begin by attuning himself to the core energy, and only after achieving success in this endeavor should he return to Hei Akion's location. As Hei Akion turned away from Wun Hui, he reminded him not to engage in any suspicious activities, emphasizing that he would not hesitate to break more than just his leg. Wun Hui contemplated the situation and concluded that he should first examine the intricacies of this martial art. If it were possible for someone to learn cultivation techniques or martial arts simply by studying instructions, then why would they need a master? In another location, Hai Akion is heading towards his place of residence. Amidst his laughter, he realized that he wasn't foolish after all. It is unfortunate that those words were incomplete, as they held great significance. These martial arts techniques were highly coveted by all martial artists. Wun Hui was taken aback when he read the inscription on the skull. If I can master it completely, I will be able to safeguard my innate core energy from depletion. There is no possibility of me dying due to the exhaustion of my innate core energy. Despite his words, it is not yet time to rejoice as I haven't finished reading it entirely. We shall celebrate once I have completed reading it once more. Let us continue perusing the article. Utilize destructive internal energy to obliterate your Dantian. Discover your original energy, and lastly, Wun Hui appears resigned. It turns out that the final part of the message was missing. This concluding section was meant to teach me how to sustain my innate energy. Angrily, Wun Hui exclaimed, You should have at least written the ending, you foolish framework. Why did you perish before completing it? Wun Hui recollected the words of Hei Akeon. Based on the old man's statement, he realized that the message was incomplete. What on earth does he expect me to do with these unfinished instructions? Out of the blue, the sword fairy greeted him, calling him a bastard and questioning his sensitivity. Surprised, Wun Hui inquired, Hey fairy, what are you referring to? Can you communicate with the skeleton? The sword elf chuckled and replied, You fool, I didn't speak to the skeleton. I'm merely conversing with this iron sword. He became furious when you referred to him as a skeleton. The sword fairy advised Wun Hui, after contemplating it, why don't you just talk to him? Upon hearing Wun Hui's question, the sword fairy was asked about the meaning behind it. Referring to the iron sword, Wun Hui inquired if the sword fairy communicated with him in the same manner as humans. The sword fairy responded with a hint of exasperation, stating that it was impossible for an inanimate object like the iron sword and herself to converse like humans. However, Wun Hui was considered special because he possessed the ability to hear the voices of the sword souls. This revelation surprised him as he also recalled the voice of the sword soul. It became clear that this was what the legend had referred to. In the secret records of sword immortals, martial arts manuals often lacked clear instructions. This explained why the thoughts of the sword could be heard. And indeed, it was the voice of this sword soul that intrigued Wun Hui. He wondered what kind of power he could obtain from it. As everything unfolded, the sword fairy advised Wun Hui to stop daydreaming and engage in conversation with the sword. It seemed that the sword had taken an interest in him after discovering his ability to hear their conversation. Wun Hui cautiously attempted to grasp the sword, and in that moment, a voice resonated, expressing the longing for the warmth of human touch after such a prolonged absence. The unexpected words from the iron sword left those who heard them astounded. Wun Hui, intrigued, gingerly reached out to touch the sword once more. Apologetically, the iron sword spoke, addressing Wun Hui by name and questioning if he could truly hear its voice. Introducing itself as the heavenly sword from the southern region, or simply known as iron, 
it revealed that its name was bestowed upon it by its master, the renowned swordsman Ho Jong Dai. Woon Hui was taken aback upon discovering the identity of the Iron Sword's master. He expressed his astonishment at the fact that the Rain was a highly esteemed swordsman, capable of single-handedly transforming the entire province of Yunnan. Had he not mysteriously vanished, he would have undoubtedly ascended to the ranks of the most esteemed martial masters in the southern central plains. Even from the rumors he had heard, it seemed that the Rain could have potentially claimed the title of the ninth top martial master in the central plains. The great individual met his unfortunate end atop a remote mountain, leaving many to question the circumstances surrounding his death. Speculations arose, with some suggesting the involvement of the infamous Hai Akion. Iron, however, dismissed such claims, stating that his master had never been defeated by Hai Akion. Wun Hui, upon hearing this, speculated that Iron's master might be one of the revered figures from the blood cult. Despite Hei Akion's inability to defeat the master swordsman from the south, the question remained, who could have possibly bested such a skilled martial artist? Iron cryptically hinted at knowing the truth, urging Wun Hui to focus on mastering the written techniques and defeating Hei Akion's disciples. Surprised by Iron's knowledge and willingness to teach, Wun Hui was taken aback when the sword fairy questioned the haste in accepting Iron's offer. Iron casually mentioned the importance of his master's honor in relation to his martial arts skills. He expressed his hope that his master's martial arts would be passed down to future generations. Wun Hui, upon hearing this, smiled and thanked Iron, expressing his desire for a successful future collaboration. Iron then proposed negotiations, suggesting that Wun Hui become his new master. Despite valuing his master's honor, Iron emphasized the significance of staying true to his purpose as a sword. He also revealed his loneliness and expressed his wish for Wun Hui to become his new master. Before he could finish speaking, Iron was interrupted by a sword strike and accused of tarnishing the reputation of swordsmen. Wun Hui observed the situation in silence. After a brief moment of contemplation, Wun Hui finally spoke up, stating that he was willing to become Iron's new master. However, he made it clear that if Iron were to behave inappropriately again, he would give up on learning the cultivation technique. Iron agreed and suggested they begin studying it. He started by explaining that the commonly referred to place of core energy is called Jing, which is located below the stomach. He further explained that there are both a lower core energy and a core energy in a different location. Wun Hui should be able to sense the core energy through his chest as his master had once mentioned that the center of the chest is the central energy core. Upon hearing Iron's explanation, Wun Hui realized that this was the first time he had heard about the existence of a central energy core. If there were lower and middle energy cores, it would imply the existence of an upper energy core as well, he thought. Iron confirmed this, and shared that his master had said that the area from the middle of the forehead is known as the upper energy core, which is crucial for enlightenment of the mind. Currently, it is relatively easy to sense the lower energy core by using the middle energy core. Wun Hui inquired once again about how he could feel the energy of life. Iron responded by acknowledging Wun Hui's previous difficulty in sensing it, and suggested that he imagine it, and try to feel it using his five senses. He added that extreme conditions or moments of danger often make it easier to perceive the energy of life. For instance, when one's life is at stake, they may experience a surge of strength or a powerful, hot energy emanating from their chest. This sensation represents the innate energy core. Upon hearing that, Wun Hui once again realized that Hei Akion's actions were not solely aimed at training his body. It became clear that Hei Akion's true intention was to make him understand the essence of innate core energy. Iron then mentioned that Wun Hui seemed to have experienced this sensation, urging him to recall the emotional state and sensations he felt during that time. Wun Hui attempted to recollect the moment when his will to survive was strongest. Following Iron's guidance, he closed his eyes and delved into his memories, reflecting on the challenges he had faced. He was taken aback by an extraordinary sensation that suddenly overwhelmed him. 
He pondered if this intense heat was the innate core energy residing within this fiery mass. Strangely, it felt oddly familiar. Observing Wun Hui's reaction, the sword fairy recalled his previous encounter and questioned if he had ever experienced a similar sensation when he swallowed a blood parasite and his eardrum burst. The iron sword fairy's words surprised him greatly. He expressed his astonishment, mentioning that his previous master had struggled for months to even sense his innate core energy. Wun Hui couldn't believe that the master swordsman had been aware of this energy for such a long time. The sword fairy then suggested that Wun Hui's ability to quickly sense the innate core energy might be due to his experience of death and subsequent revival. The iron sword fairy urged Wun Hui to refocus his attention on feeling the energy and advised him to concentrate on his innate core energy. By doing so, he would be able to perceive a faint trace of energy, no larger than a fingernail, within his middle energy core. If he were to learn the technique of cultivating innate energy, he could harness and develop this power. Wun Hui remained focused as he mentioned that he could sense something about the size of two fingers, despite not being able to feel the size of a fingernail. Iron was taken aback by Wun Hui's words, finding it hard to believe that he could detect such a significant amount of innate core energy. Encouraged by the sword fairy, Wun Hui was advised to strike the stone pillar to test his inner core energy. The fairy assured him that even if his hand was damaged in the process, his innate core energy would aid in its recovery. Wun Hui chuckled at the fairy's words, pointing out that it was easy for him to say since it wasn't his hand at risk. However, he was prepared to push himself to the limit and see how strong he truly was. In a surprising turn of events, Wun Hui effortlessly shattered the stone pillar with a single strike. Iron marveled at Wun Hui's display of power, realizing that his previous master's core energy paled in comparison. He predicted that Wun Hui's abundance of innate core energy would accelerate his mastery of martial arts significantly. Wun Hui, amazed by his own abilities, confirmed that he was not dreaming and was excited to explore the extent of his newfound power. As the evening drew near, Wun Hui was spotted meeting Hei Akion. Angrily, Hei Akion accused him of being useless and attempting to escape. Wun Hui, who was lying down after being stepped on, explained that he had been climbing the cliff for the past two months, which made it impossible for him to return on time due to his lack of proper mobility. Hei Akion insisted that he needed to move faster to return quickly, pressing his foot harder on Wun Hui's head. Despite the pain, Wun Hui regretted not leaving half a day earlier to arrive on time. Upon reaching the evil cave, Wun Hui knelt down and admitted that he couldn't feel the innate core energy, feeling completely empty. Upon hearing that, Hei Akion acknowledged that such a realization cannot be achieved overnight. By witnessing Wun Hui's suffering, he understood the importance of concealing a significant portion of his abilities in order to survive. Revealing all one's cards, whether within the Disciple Alliance or elsewhere, would always result in a disadvantage. It dawned on him that one cannot detect another person's core energy unless they actively seek it out, just as Iron had mentioned. After a brief moment of contemplation, Hei Akion burst into laughter. I almost fell for your trick, he remarked. It appears that you are conserving your core energy to prolong your life. I believe it is imperative for you to take this matter seriously. Hei Akion then declared, If you lose, I will hand you over to the captain. Wun Hui was taken aback upon hearing that. He wondered why Captain O was present all of a sudden. Feeling frustrated, he realized that Captain O was still after him even after two months had passed. He had thought that Captain O had given up. Hei Akion mentioned that Captain O had been visiting frequently ever since Wun Hui was brought there. Although Wun Hui didn't pay much attention to his words, it seemed like Captain O wanted him back. The twins informed Wun Hui that Captain O was pursuing him. They warned that if Captain O discovered that there were no blood parasites in his body, he would forever be considered a low-class warrior. Wun Hui questioned if this was different from the promise made to him. Hai Akian chuckled and assured him that he would help him avoid the fight in every possible way. He asked Wun Hui if he now felt motivated to learn how to sense innate core energy. Wun Hui, with a soft laugh, inquired about the threat of being killed by Hei Akion's master. 
He asked what would happen if he won the fight. Shouldn't there be a reward for the victor? Ha-Akion then pulled out a book from under his clothes and acknowledged Wun Hui's bravery. He agreed to grant Wun Hui a request if he emerged victorious. However, he emphasized that the offer was contingent on Wun Hui winning. As he handed over the notebook, he advised Wun Hui to read and comprehend it to learn the martial arts recorded within, specifically the Battle Chakram Warrior's Light Chakram art. Holding the notebook, Wun Hui pondered how he would fare in combat, realizing that his knowledge was limited to cultivation techniques. Hei Akion mentioned that he was unsure about the energy circulation technique used by the skeleton. The light chakram martial art is considered a well-balanced energy circulation technique, making it easier to learn various martial arts. Zhuabek and Wu Hyun also mastered this technique. Instead of complaining about unfairness, it is important to focus on the skeleton's note. This is the sword technique that your master employed. Wun Hui believes that the martial arts sword technique, luminous star sword technique, is the holding technique of Master Ho Zhang. He overheard someone mentioning the evil sword. It was puzzling why the old grandfather possessed Ho Zhang Dei's martial arts records. Perhaps he was searching for this note from Ho Zhang Dei's remains. Observing Wun Hui's quiet response, Hei Akian gently touched his head and asked what was troubling him. He inquired if Wun Hui was not pleased. Wun Hui swiftly expressed his disbelief, questioning how such a thing could be possible. Maintaining silence, I had a question for the gentleman. I inquired about the reason behind his possession of this secretive fusion record of martial arts. Hai Akian remained silent for a brief moment before revealing that he had acquired it as a gift from someone. Wun Hui proceeded to inform Iron about the incident, to which Iron firmly declared it to be a falsehood. I pondered upon the identity of the thief who had stolen the note, only to discover that it was Wun Hui himself. He had attempted to utilize that technique to defeat my master in a battle. The wicked individual had promised to teach Wun Hui the luminous star sword technique. Wun Hui confirmed this, stating that he would receive instruction once a day, starting from tomorrow. Upon hearing this, Iron reiterated that if the man was willing to teach it, it meant he had completely mastered the sword technique. Undoubtedly, he would employ it to enhance his own martial skills. Additionally, the twins would undoubtedly make an appearance during the fight, having studied and developed their own martial arts. I surmised that he was attempting to make the battle worthwhile for me. However, it seemed impossible as there was a disparity in skill. Upon hearing Iron's words, the sword fairy expressed her anger deeming him to be an exceedingly peculiar individual. How could he alter the fact that he had been defeated by Master Ho Jong Dei through such means? Iron continued speaking, stating that his master Ho Jong Dai had passed away. He mentioned that Master Ho Jong Dai had fought numerous battles against evil, but neither he nor Iron were able to determine the true winner. With his master gone, there was no longer a way to determine who was greater so Iron resorted to using methods like the one at hand. Wun Hui listened to Iron's explanation and questioned him, reminding him that he had previously claimed that Hai Akion had never won against Master Ho Jong Dei. Iron nonchalantly replied, clarifying that what he meant was that their fights always ended in a draw. As Wun Hui placed the secret note in his shirt, he expressed his belief that the outcome could only be determined by the events that unfold. He acknowledged that if he were to lose, it would validate Iron's previous statement, but he still had time to contemplate his next move. Observing Wun Hui's restlessness, Iron reassured him that there was no need to worry. He explained that the stolen Luminous Star Sword technique was a version that his master had yet to develop fully. After losing the secret notes, his master began to refine his sword martial arts techniques. Iron emphasized that every movement in a sword technique had its weaknesses, and although the old and new movements may appear similar, the flow of each movement had been improved through development. Wun Hui, after completing his exercises, expressed his understanding of Iron's explanation. He realized that when he used the newly developed version of the sword technique, there was indeed a difference compared to the techniques written in the secret records. Iron concluded by stating that if he hadn't stolen the secret notes, his master would not have considered refining his sword technique. It appears to have been a stroke of luck.
Out of the blue, the sword fairy apologized for the interruption in the conversation. However, hey, Akion wouldn't be taken aback if you were to employ the sword technique that has been honed. He will surely question why you didn't follow his instructions. Iron nonchalantly mentioned that it would indeed be challenging for someone who had recently learned sword techniques to refine them. The refinement of sword techniques was achievable for some, like Master Ho Jong Dai, who possessed a natural talent for swordsmanship. Woon Hui simply smiled and remarked that this was a true dilemma. If he lost, he would be relegated to a low-class warrior for the rest of his days. On the other hand, if he emerged victorious, he would face interrogation. Nevertheless, it seemed that he would have to rely on the sword technique he had developed. I will adapt it to suit my needs, Woon Hui stated as he continued walking. No one will fall for the same deception twice. I just need to apply it in different scenarios. Captain O oh was spotted conversing with someone. Amidst laughter, he declared, Woon Hui, this time I will catch you for sure. I don't know how you managed to become Elder Akion's servant, but I have found a replacement for you now. You won't be able to escape from me. Captain O oh went on, Hey Do Hyun, when you encounter him, demonstrate the skills of a top-tier warrior. When you engage in combat with him, make sure to defeat him. On his way to Hai Akion's residence, Woon Hui was spotted. Unexpectedly, Captain O oh intercepted him. With a laugh, Captain O oh addressed Woon Hui from the So clan, remarking that it had been a while since they last saw each other. Trying to maintain composure, Woon Hui saluted Captain O oh and introduced himself as Su Woon Hui a middle-class cadet. Captain O casually advised him to relax, mentioning that it seemed like Woon Hui had put in great effort to become Hei Akion's servant. Iron then asked Woon Hui if he was the person they had been discussing, the one who was constantly being pursued. Woon Hui confirmed that he was indeed the one, but he was unsure who was accompanying Captain O. He wondered if Captain O himself had brought the person. Suddenly, Captain O oh placed his hand on Woon Hui's shoulder. Observing this, Woon Hui thought to himself that this despicable person had unexpectedly used his core energy on him. Captain O, oh, with a slight smile, expressed his surprise, mentioning that he had believed there was something special about Woon Hui that made Hei Akion want to bring him here. He predicted that Woon Hui would undergo a change in a few months, but it turned out that his Dantian was still damaged, just as before. Upon hearing this, Woon Hui remained silent and pondered once more. It appeared that even after utilizing his core energy to examine my body, he still couldn't detect my innate core. Then Captain O oh declared that he would be the one to replace me in serving Hei Akion. He emphasized that he, being a middle-class warrior, would be far superior to me in serving Hei Akion. According to him, I am nothing compared to this replacement and he questioned how I would be able to convince the captain of the wolfblood. He even mentioned the possibility of me being a descendant of a cult, but it turns out that no one in the Yunnan area has ever seen my grandfather. Furthermore, he insisted that I accompany him back to the Valley of Cycles for further interrogation. Upon hearing this, Woon Hui thought to himself that Captain O oh was truly stubborn. He couldn't believe that he was still attempting to gain recognition in this manner. Calmly. Woon Hui addressed the captain, stating that there seemed to be a misunderstanding. He explained that his grandfather had to conceal his affiliation with the Wolfblood squad, as it would have been impossible for him to reveal his true identity to everyone. Additionally, Woon Hui was confident that Hai Akeon would not be satisfied with just a middle-class warrior replacing him. Captain O, oh, upon hearing Woon Hui's response, became visibly enraged, with an intense gaze, he insulted Woon Hui, calling him a bastard. He seized this opportunity to teach Woon Hui a lesson, ensuring that he wouldn't become arrogant, and to make a favorable impression on Hei Akion. Captain O oh then shouted, instructing Do Yun to swiftly teach Woon Hui a valuable lesson in order to rectify his behavior. He took full responsibility for the matter. Do Hyun approached Woon Hui and mentioned that despite having no grudge against him, he couldn't pass up such a good opportunity. He advised Woon Hui to brace himself as things might get a bit uncomfortable. Woon Hui remained silent, inwardly cursing the situation and feeling underestimated. 
Without warning, Do Yun threw a punch towards Wun Hui, who managed to swiftly evade the attack. Witnessing Wun Hui's agility, both Do Yun and Captain O oh were taken aback. They questioned how Wun Hui could dodge the strike so effortlessly. As Wun Hui observed Do Yun's movements, he recognized the familiar techniques of a middle class warrior in the cult. Despite the seemingly flawless form, Wun Hui found the movement sluggish compared to his own due to his advanced training in the luminous star sword technique. He couldn't help but feel superior to the middle class warriors he encountered. Hai Akian swiftly approached Do Yun from behind, accusing him of attempting to harm his servant. Before Do Yun could respond, Hai Akian decisively snapped his neck, causing his immediate demise in front of Wun Hui. Following this, Ha Akian seized Captain O, oh, who expressed remorse for his actions as a member of the Blood Destruction Squad. Despite Captain O's explanation, Hei Akian reprimanded him for causing a disturbance near his residence. Witnessing these events, Wun Hui realized the extent of Hei Akian's martial arts prowess, making him feel inadequate in comparison. Suddenly, someone called out to Wun Hui, questioning his progress in learning sword techniques and remarking on his appearance. Upon hearing this, Wun Hui silently acknowledged that despite only being there for a few days, their bodies had already grown significantly stronger. He wondered about the intensity of their training and the hardships they must have endured. Suddenly, Captain O's voice interrupted his thoughts, pleading with Hei Akion to listen to him. He requested permission to investigate the unknown origin of the intruder. However, before Captain O could finish his sentence, Hei Akion abruptly struck him on the head, dismissing his words. Hei Akion expressed his disinterest in Captain O's chatter and criticized him for bringing others to their location. As he released the unconscious Captain O, Hei Akion turned to Wun Hui and remarked that he must be disturbed to bring someone else as a replacement. Wun Hui nonchalantly replied, admitting that before being kidnapped and taken to the valley, he had managed to kill two of Captain O's subordinates. Upon hearing this, Hei Akion laughed, mocking Wun Hui for thinking he could kill anyone without a Dantian. He believed it was natural for weak individuals to perish. Finding the situation intriguing, Hei Akion suggested throwing the unconscious Captain O oh off the cliff. Twabek asked if they should proceed with the act, to which Hei Akion replied that they should throw him off the cliff with great force. Hei Akion raised his voice questioning if he should take matters into his own hands due to the incompetence of his servant. Urging for a quick execution of his commands, he then turned to Wun Hui, expressing concern over the precarious situation he found himself in being pursued by wild dogs. He remarked on the relentless nature of such predators, emphasizing the rareness of opportunities like this. Upon hearing Hei Akian's warning, Wun Hui excused himself to assist Captain O. Oh. Observing Wun Hui following closely behind, Twabek invited him to join in the task of retrieving the captain. He also offered to take over should Wun Hui tire during the descent down the cliff. Before Wun Hui could respond, Twabek swiftly leaped off the cliff, taunting Wun Hui for his slow pace. Wun Hui, puzzled by Twabek's actions, pondered on the possibility of mastering the Qinggong technique of the Southern Heaven swordsman Ho Zhong Dai to match his agility. Seeking guidance, Wun Hui inquired about the Qinggong technique from Zhuabek, who responded by affectionately holding his hand. He stated that he would certainly teach the master Southern Heaven Swordsman's Qinggong. However, running on the steep cliff face in that manner would be completely impossible unless one utilizes his unique Qinggong. Both Ha Akian and even Master Ho Zhong Dai were greatly impressed upon witnessing his Qinggong. Hai Akshian overheard this, and Wun Hui thought to himself that he truly understood how strong he was. Although he could clearly see it, he needed to quickly move from his current position as he didn't want to fall too far behind. That infuriating Twabek, he was genuinely curious if he comprehended what Hai Akshian had said. Upon reaching the bottom of the cliff, Twabek placed Captain O on the ground. He remarked that it would be sufficient to leave him there. Then he questioned whether he should end it. Wun Hui then asked Zhuabek what his intentions were, especially after witnessing how he had forcefully grabbed Captain O's leg. 
Zhua Bek casually responded, saying that it seemed like Wun Hui had finally arrived. He mentioned that Hei Akian always said the same thing, expressing his need to release his anger. Therefore, this presented a perfect opportunity for him. He vowed to ensure that Captain O's leg would be broken, causing him to retire and return to being a warrior. Wun Hui unsheathed his sword and stated that it appeared Zhua Bek had misunderstood the situation. He questioned whether Zhua Bek truly believed that Hai Akian would simply stop if he were to break her leg. Nervously, Zhua Bek asked if Hei Akian wanted them to kill Captain O. Wun Hui dismissed this as nonsense, questioning why they would need to kill him. Wun Hui nonchalantly inquired, Do you feel remorseful for him? Step aside. If you are unable to do it, I will take care of it. Suddenly a forceful kick landed on Zhua Bek's face, causing him to be thrown backwards. Witnessing this, Wun Hui pondered, Captain O has regained consciousness. You wretched Jwabek! Did he not defend Captain O's pressure points while he was unconscious? Chuckling, Captain O remarked, What were you scoundrels discussing? So that's your game. With an intense stare, he added, You will rue the day you missed the chance to eliminate me. Thus, Wun Hui of the So Clan, the imminent commencement of the fight, was observed. Captain O, while laughing, inquired about the intentions regarding the sword. He questioned whether the sword alone would be sufficient to harm him. Witnessing the captain's enthusiasm, Iron also expressed surprise at the newfound ability to employ martial arts. It was advised to strike when the captain appeared to lower his guard. With a leap and a punch, Captain O launched an attack on Wun Hui. He questioned whether someone lacking internal energy and possessing such weakness could inflict harm upon him. However, Wun Hui effortlessly defended against Captain O's sudden assault, using only his bare hands. The captain was greatly astonished by the ease with which his attack was thwarted. He pondered how a feeble individual like Wun Hui could withstand his assault so effortlessly. As Captain O began to relax his guard, Wun Hui swiftly retaliated with a horizontal sword technique, successfully striking the captain's body and causing him to stumble backwards. Wun Hui believed the surprise attack had gone well, as he managed to land a hit and inflict injury. Furthermore, he discovered his ability to utilize internal energy. Observing Wun Hui's success in injuring Captain O, Iron commended his initial attempt at employing sword martial arts. However, caution was advised, as the opponent was a highly skilled martial arts master. It was emphasized that the forthcoming real fight would require utmost vigilance. Despite enduring pain, Captain O contemplated the absence of internal energy in his attacks and the ability of his opponent to evade and counterattack. Wun Hui's surprise attack with his sword caught Captain O off guard. Reacting swiftly, Captain O used a rolling technique to evade the attack and jumped backwards. He was astonished by his own actions, realizing that he had resorted to such a defensive move, even though his life was in danger. He couldn't believe that he had to employ rolling and jumping techniques while fighting against someone as young as Wun Hui. How could Wun Hui possess such power without having a Dantian? Captain O considered him to be extremely dangerous and felt the need to eliminate him immediately. With a sharp and angry gaze, Captain O warned Wun Hui not to be arrogant, as it could lead to his own downfall. Meanwhile, Hua Bek regained consciousness after being kicked hard by Captain O. He was surprised to witness Wun Hui's ability to hold his own against Captain O. Hua Bek wondered when Captain O had woken up and how Wun Hui could match his strength. The situation had become quite perplexing. Captain O, being a top-class warrior, was overpowering Wun Hui, who was considered weak and lacked a Dantian. Wun Hui endured the pain from Captain O's kick to his chest and realized that he had been fortunate enough to avoid any serious internal injuries. He marveled at the difference in abilities between a top-class warrior and a mid-class warrior. Observing this, Iron commented that Captain O's body condition might not be at its best due to the initial attack on his chest. Iron suggested that buying more time would be advantageous. Wun Hui agreed with Iron's assessment, realizing that if he could prolong the fight, Captain O's condition would weaken further. There was a sudden noise, prompting Zhua Bek to instruct Wun Hui to pull over. As he lunged towards Captain O, 
He commended him for holding it together in his absence and declared that he would take charge from that moment on. He advised Wun Hui to observe how Jwabek fights. Captain O effortlessly dodged Jwabek's reckless attack and retaliated with a powerful punch to the face, cautioning him not to rush. He threatened to kill Wun Hui first before dealing with Jwabek. Song Jwabek, after receiving a brutal blow from Captain O, managed to strike back with a forceful kick to the face. Witnessing this, Wun Hui remarked on the pain inflicted. Despite the attack, Wun Hui showed resilience and even managed to counterattack Captain O. Wabek taunted Captain O, claiming his punches were weak compared to Hei Akion's. He vowed to seek revenge for the humiliation suffered during the selection test. In response, Captain O spat blood at Jwabek, momentarily distracting him. Seizing the opportunity, Captain O unleashed his core energy and launched a fierce attack on Jwabek, vowing to end his life. Upon witnessing Captain O's imminent attack, Wun Hui contemplated his options. Realizing that he couldn't halt the captain's assault at the moment, he devised a plan to target Wabek's legs, allowing him to escape the attack range. Seizing the opportunity created by this diversion, Wun Hui swiftly thrust his sword, displaying immense strength as it pierced through a tree. This attack, he believed, would be the decisive blow. However, to his surprise, Captain O laughed even after being struck by Wun Hui's sword, claiming that he had immobilized Wun Hui's right hand and rendering it useless. Captain O vowed to destroy Wun Hui's hands. Undeterred, Wun Hui attempted to draw his short sword and swiftly launched an attack on Captain O using a lightning-fast technique. With both hands now free, Wun Hui was confident that he could finally defeat his opponent. Yet, Captain O, with his vast combat experience, effortlessly withstood Wun Hui's assault, laughing all the while. He taunted Wun Hui, remarking on his futile efforts to kill him and squandering yet another opportunity. Wun Hui was astonished to witness Captain O successfully blocking his close-range attack, realizing that his opponent still possessed considerable strength and energy. Despite employing his technique, Wun Hui felt as though his internal organs were being torn apart due to the immense pressure from his innate core energy. Captain O, oh, still laughing, mockingly questioned Wun Hui on what other fighting techniques he had left to showcase. The sword fairy then raised her voice towards Wun Hui, commanding him to draw his short sword immediately and be cautious. Suddenly, a forceful kick from Jwabek struck the short sword directly, causing it to pierce Captain O's face instantly. Captain O's body was thrown back with such force that he died on the spot. Iron remarked that if it weren't for Jwabek's intervention, the situation could have been much more perilous. He had already unleashed his inner core energy, and had Jwabek attacked, the outcome might have been fatal. Jwabek, with a hint of arrogance, commented on Captain O's audacity to spill blood on others. He then turned to Wun Hui, claiming that he now owed him his life. Wun Hui, realizing this was his first kill, appeared visibly thrilled. Jwabek added that they were not going to engage in combat immediately, but he was confident that he would emerge victorious in a fight between them. This would allow him to become a disciple of the esteemed Hai Akion, as promised to him. While holding Wun Hui, Jwabek mentioned that he had heard about Wun Hui's request in case of victory, dismissing it as insignificant. Wun Hui retorted, expressing uncertainty about the outcome despite Jwabek's confidence. Jwabek laughed, asserting that Wun Hui wouldn't stand a chance against him in a battle. Wun Hui nonchalantly proposed a bet, suggesting that the loser would become the winner's slave. Confident in his abilities, he asked Jwabek for his thoughts. Jwabek accepted the challenge, expressing curiosity about Wun Hui's skills. Despite his uncertainty, Jwabek decided to go upstairs to observe Hei Akion. Witnessing Jwabek's impressive cliff-jumping skills, Wun Hui contemplated making him and Wu Hyun his subordinates, feeling a surge of excitement at the idea. Subsequently, Wun Hui summoned Iron and inquired about Hai Akion's Qing Gong technique, compared to Master Ho Zhong Dai's Luminous Star Sword technique. Iron confirmed that Hai Akion's Qing Gong was indeed superior, as Master Ho Zhong Dai himself was impressed by it. Delighted by this revelation, Wun Hui pondered aloud whether he should act according to his own desires. 
Dwabek sprinted up the steep cliff and eventually reached High Akion's residence. Upon arrival, Dwabek confidently stated, Sir, I have completed your orders. High Akion, holding Dwabek's head, inquired, Why did you return alone after finishing what I asked? Where is he? Nervously, Dwabek explained, I had to come back first because his Qinggong skills were slow. He should arrive in about 30 minutes. He hasn't mastered Qinggong yet, so catching up with me is impossible, sir. Approaching Dwabek, Hai Akion observed, Your irregular breathing suggests internal injuries from the fight with Captain O. Who killed him? Dwabek promptly confessed, I did, sir. I was the one who killed Captain O. Hai Akion chuckled and remarked, That's how it should be. You had a serious encounter with Captain O. Dwabek realized that Woon Hui's advice was accurate. Merely injuring Captain O's leg wouldn't satisfy Hai Akion. Laughing, Hei Akion added, You faced a formidable martial artist and sustained only minor injuries because of your association with him. Wun Hui must be in a dire state now. The atmosphere shifted when Hei Akion laid eyes on Wun Hui, who had just entered his residence nonchalantly. Wun Hui informed, Sir, I have taken care of Captain O as per your instructions. Observing Wun Hui's composed demeanor, Hai Akion tightened his grip and declared, Henceforth, we shall prolong our training sessions. Dwabek, feeling anxious, interjected, Sir, please do not misunderstand. I played a significant role in that altercation. He only finished off Captain O after he was severely injured from my attack. In response, Hai Akion rebuked Dwabek, Silence, you scoundrel! No more excuses! Keep quiet! Witnessing the exchange, Woon Hui thought to himself, I suppose he is not as harsh as I thought, provided he refrains from making excuses. Perhaps Dwabek is also enduring his own struggles. Hai Akion turned to Woon Hui and inquired, What are you staring at? If you have finished your report, leave promptly. Woon Hui replied, Very well, sir. However, I would like to discuss a request I mentioned earlier. Intrigued, Hei Akion asked, are you seeking something in return? Only if you emerge victorious in the upcoming battle, then speak. Wun Hui casually mentioned, It is a minor matter. I have always admired your ability to navigate the cliff effortlessly. I would greatly appreciate it if you could teach me. I will not press you if you are unwilling. Chuckling, Hai Akion responded, So you are referring to my Qinggong skill? Very well, I agree. If you win, I will instruct you. Gratefully, Woon Hui saluted and expressed his thanks. Hai Akion bowed in return, envisioning a future where the blood cult reigned supreme. Woon Hui immediately accepted my request, indicating his confidence in my ability to defeat Zhua Bek and Wu Yun in the upcoming fight. Hai Akion then spoke again, informing me that the fight would take place in three months. He warned me that without Captain O's protection, I would suffer losses if I were to lose the fight. Hei Akion advised me to train diligently and with a sense of urgency, as if my life depended on it. He instructed me to return to my place of residence while he continued to train the other two fighters. I obediently agreed and promised to return. With a smile on his face, Wun Hui was certain that he would master the King Kong technique. He felt optimistic after defeating both opponents and believed that his first attack on Captain O was successful due to the previous injuries inflicted by Hei Akion. Iron, who was cleaning himself, asked Woon Hui about his experience using the Luminator technique in battle. Woon Hui admitted that he was able to kill Captain O, but felt that his attack landed too easily, suspecting that it was because of Hei Akion's previous strike. Iron casually mentioned that although it wasn't a specific technique, it was one of the fundamental sword moves. Woon Hui couldn't help but feel a sense of awe at the mention of his previous master, Ho Jong Dae, and wondered if he was truly as powerful as the Southern Heaven swordsman who could keep up with Hei Ak Kion. The sword fairy suddenly exclaimed with joy, advising not to dwell too much on the victory. The crucial aspect is that you emerged victorious after defeating a formidable opponent. Therefore, it is imperative to concentrate on your training. Woon Hui mentioned that there are only three months left until the upcoming fight. 
Observing Wabek's fighting style today, it is evident that he will pose a significant challenge. Should we revisit practicing holding techniques once more? Iron promptly replied affirmatively, emphasizing the importance of mastering the 18 fundamental sword movements naturally to avoid turning your technique into a mere performance. It is essential for the sword technique to become ingrained in your body. We shall not delve into other techniques until then. Subsequently, the sword fairy quietly spoke to Iron, mentioning Wun Hui's desire to learn Hayakian's Qinggong technique. Do you not feel a sense of loss? Technically, Wun Hui is the successor of your former master. Iron calmly responded, acknowledging the potential for sadness from that perspective. However, Wun Hui's inheritance of Master Ho Zhong Dei's sword techniques does not equate to being a replacement for him. It is natural for martial artists to seek strength and explore various martial arts practices. Hai Akian was seen training with Zhuabek, expressing disappointment in Zhuabek's performance and questioning his judgment despite personally teaching him the luminous star sword technique. Upon hearing that, Zhuabek inquired, Sir, is it truly necessary to take it this far? Even if I am only going to face Wun Hui, in three months he will surely progress much slower than me. Before Huabek could respond, a wooden blow struck his face. Hei Akian sternly stated, What a fool, you have not learned anything from your previous encounter with him. Wun Hui is currently training in solitude with just two secret martial arts manuals. Yet he managed to avoid sustaining internal injuries after clashing with Captain O. Oh. Zhuabek was taken aback upon hearing this. He insisted that it was absolutely impossible. I witnessed it firsthand, if he were to be repeatedly struck by Captain O. Oh. While gesturing towards Zhuabek, Hai Akian remarked, Do you think I am unable to see through this, whether he has internal injuries or not? You should be aware as you were the one who fought alongside him. You fail to recognize Wun Hui's capabilities. You underestimate him greatly. You have squandered the opportunity I provided you. Upon hearing Hei Akian's remarks, Zhuabek pondered that he is always being compared to Wun Hui. I am certain that I will emerge victorious. I will surely defeat Wun Hui. Zhuabek expressed his enthusiasm, saying, Please, master, show me that technique again. I am determined to learn it until I can master it. Hei Akian, while laughing, responded, You still want to see it, even though I have hit you many times? Zhuabek firmly stated that this kind of training meant nothing to him. He confidently declared, I, Zhuabek, will definitely show you that I am on a completely different level compared to someone like Wun Hui. Just wait and see, I will surely defeat Wun Hui in our next fight. However, before Zhuabek could continue, Hai Akian struck him once again. Hai Akian emphasized that if Zhuabek truly aimed to be the best, he had to demonstrate it through his actions, not just his words. Hai Akian then proceeded to say, Now that you have finished learning my technique, I will teach you something else. Surprised, Huabek asked, What do you mean by that? Have you chosen me as your best student? Zhuabek assured Hei Akian that he would do his best as his student. However, Zhuabek's words were interrupted by a sudden powerful blow to his body. Hei Akian questioned, Who said you would be my student? Suddenly someone saluted Hei Akian, and everyone present bowed expressing their loyalty to the blood cult. Commander Gu introduced himself and asked if Captain O oh and a middle-class warrior had visited Hai Akian. Hai Akian, with a piercing gaze, challenged Commander Gu, asking if he dared to bother him over a mere warrior troop leader. After the passage of three months, Wun Hui was observed engaging in meditation atop a stone pedestal. Suddenly, a sizable hailstone descended and struck his physique. Without casting a glance prior to the hailstone's descent, Wun Hui swiftly employed his sword to sever the hailstone until it fragmented into numerous pieces. Witnessing Wun Hui's prompt reaction, Iron remarked that his stance while cleaving the ice remained unsteady. Refusing to accept defeat, the fairy retorted that Wun Hui was foolish, asserting that his performance appeared satisfactory in her eyes. Upon hearing the bickering between the sword and iron fairies, Wun Hui interjected, urging them to cease their quarrel. He emphasized the necessity of maintaining a resolute and unfeeling demeanor during practice. All right, then let us proceed to the battleground without delay, Wun Hui declared. 
During their journey, Wun Hui approached the Southern Heaven Sword Spirit, known as Iron, and asked for an honest assessment of his sword technique. Iron nonchalantly replied that Wun Hui's sword technique was still lacking, as he could only perform half of what Master Ho Zhang Dei could do. However, Iron acknowledged Wun Hui's remarkable progress, considering he had only been practicing for three months. Wun Hui expressed gratitude, attributing his achievements to Iron's guidance, acknowledging that he wouldn't have reached this point without it. Suddenly, the sword fairy interjected, expressing dissatisfaction with Wun Hui's indifference towards her. Despite his use of martial arts techniques, she claimed credit for their victories, boasting about killing three opponents in their previous fights. Wun Hui dismissed her claims, stating that their recent fight was merely a sparring practice, emphasizing that there was no need for her to kill his opponent and urging her to stop her nonsense. Ignoring the sword fairy's protest, Wun Hui turned to Iron and inquired about his chances of winning, considering he had only learned three sword techniques in the past three months. Iron calmly reassured him, stating that even though he hadn't reached the level of Master Ho Zhong Dai in terms of sword technique, Wun Hui was almost perfect to face him. Iron advised him to focus on the three sword techniques he had mastered rather than learning new ones half-heartedly. With his current strength, Wun Hui was encouraged to be confident and give it his best shot. Upon hearing Iron's explanation, Wun Hui smiled and expressed his gratitude before meeting Hai Akion at the designated location. Hai Akion, while laughing, remarked on Wun Hui's prompt arrival and commended him for not fleeing. After a brief exchange, Wun Hui saluted and expressed his readiness for the impending fight. Observing Zhuabek and Wu Yun standing behind Hei Akion, Wun Hui pondered on their muscular physique and speculated on the training they underwent. Hei Akion, noticing Wun Hui's curiosity, teased him about the strength of his companions. Setting the rules for the fight, Hei Akion emphasized the importance of perseverance and determination. Wun Hui, unfazed by the challenge, inquired about his opponent to which Zhuabek confidently revealed himself. As Zhuabek advanced towards Wun Hui, the latter contemplated the situation, relieved that it was not a two-on-one battle, but wary of Zhuabek's weapon of choice. Zhuabek chuckled and remarked, What you're witnessing is truly unfair. While I fight with my bare hands, you rely on a sword. It's merely a plaything that Hei Akion used in his youth. Wun Hui burst into laughter and countered, even so, it appears to be a formidable tool capable of withstanding attacks from my rusty iron sword. As Wun Hui toyed with his fingers, he added, Although Hei Akion's unique martial arts have undoubtedly improved, I believe a fair fight is still necessary considering your physical abilities. Enraged by Wun Hui's words, Zhuabeik charged forward, exclaiming, How dare you underestimate Hei Akion's martial arts! I won't forgive you! Observing the provoked Zhuabek, Wun Hui began to contemplate. It was quite simple to deduce that if Zhuabek approached him, he could exploit his advantage as a swordsman. The moment Zhuabek entered the range of his sword, Wun Hui would unleash the powerful Tiger Force sword dance technique. As Zhuabek was struck by Wun Hui's attack, he could only defend himself with both hands. Witnessing the intense battle between Wun Hui and Zhuabek, Hai Akion chuckled and thought, so he employed the Tiger Force sword technique. It seems he has trained diligently. However, that alone is still insufficient to defeat Zhuabek. However, in a sudden turn of events, Zhuabek managed to grasp Wun Hui's hand, preventing him from escaping. With a sneer, Zhuabek taunted, Nowhere to run, you wretched fool. In retaliation, Zhuabek unleashed a series of punches, reminding Wun Hui of their shared history. Yet to everyone's surprise, Wun Hui skillfully evaded the blows and swiftly countered with a powerful kick aimed at Zhuabek's chin. The confrontation didn't end there, as Zhuabek swiftly retaliated with another kick, sending Wun Hui flying backwards. As Zhuabek rubbed his chin, he scoffed, questioning the unorthodox use of feet in combat. Unfazed, Wun Hui chuckled and remarked, Your inner strength has certainly grown since three months ago. Have you been consuming elixirs or some other concoction to enhance your physical prowess? Amidst his laughter, Zhuabek dismissed the notion, 
claiming it was all due to his relentless training in Hai Akian's martial arts. Observing Zhuabek's behavior, Wun Hui couldn't help but suspect that he was lying. The subtle movement of his pupils betrayed his enthusiasm, making it evident that Wabek's loyalty lay with the blood cult. Wun Hui realized that not only martial arts, but everything else associated with Wabek posed a threat to him. In the future, alongside Wu Yun, they would rise as formidable figures within the blood cult, receiving unwavering support, both materially and emotionally. Then Wun Hui uttered, I have made a mistake. Upon hearing this, Wabek responded arrogantly, claiming that Wun Hui was wrong in his statement. Do you plan on giving up? Zhuabek taunted. Wun Hui firmly replied, I will give my utmost effort now. Zhuabek was left speechless, unable to utter a word. Suddenly, with the swiftness of lightning, Wun Hui swiftly struck Zhuabek's body, slicing through the middle. Zhuabek was taken aback, astonished to find himself injured by Wun Hui's attack. He pondered what had transpired, questioning how he could have been harmed without even perceiving the slightest movement. Witnessing Wun Hui's lightning-fast movements that inflicted injury upon Zhuabek, Hai Akian remained silent, lost in thought. Wun Hui observed Hai Akian's expression and contemplated, realizing that although Hai Akian appeared composed on the outside, his countenance was gradually becoming impassive. How does it feel now that the tables have turned? Surely. You did not anticipate this outcome. It is still too early for you to be astonished. The true battle is about to commence. Zhuabek remained lying down after being struck by Wun Hui's attack. He believed that the attack he had just experienced was the third sword technique of the luminous star swords. I'm aware of this because Hei Akion had shown it to me before. Zhuabek recalled the time when he was being trained by Hei Akion. Heiakion had told him that a martial artist who specializes in fist fighting can indeed combat a martial artist who wields a sword. The key is to get close to your opponent every time they make a move with their sword, allowing you to redirect the direction of their attack. Despite the pain, Dwabek expressed his astonishment, stating that Wun Hui's attack was incredibly fast, even to the point where he couldn't see it. Heiakion responded with a laugh, saying that he would continue to strike Dwabek until he could perceive the direction of the attack. Zhuabek pondered further, realizing that Wun Hui's luminous star sword technique was on par with Hei Akian's. He couldn't understand how Wun Hui had become so powerful without any formal training. Observing Zhuabek's silence, Wun Hui addressed him, asking why he hadn't gotten up yet, and if he had given up. In response, Zhuabek immediately rose to his feet, asserting that he had not given up, and that an attack like Wun Hui's meant nothing to him. He then proceeded to insult Wun Hui, boasting about his direct training under Hai Akian and his daily practice of the luminous star sword technique. Zhuabek vowed not to be careless again and declared that he would fight Wun Hui with all his strength. Iron, who had been observing the situation, wondered how Zhuabek had managed to withstand Hai Akian's martial arts attack with only minor scratches. If this continued, Iron believed that Wun Hui would only be able to follow the pre-planned tactics.